So the reason we're going to get into this is because I noticed when I was watching this Dr. K video, which I love Dr. K, of course, when I was watching it and he was with Destiny, he was saying things about halfway through. I mean, the whole thing is great, but about halfway through, he started to say things that I was like, oh, 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 I feel like this is related to work that I do in the exploration. You know, I always ask myself, I'm always meditating. I'm like, what am I doing here? And you, I used to just make content because I was in politics. And then I made content because I wanted to talk about my life. And then I made content to meet people who were like-minded. And then I made content to sort of talk about the levels and bubble hopping and the life you can have between existing and existence. And now as I'm watching this Dr. K video, not only does he mention things, like I have stories that I got to tell you. I can't wait to watch this with you. But he mentions like this, this work that I've been trying to convey to people, but also how you can discover things without knowing the names of it. Have you guys ever heard of the coincidence where people will discover things on separate parts of the planet and then it won't, it will be a mystery of who discovered it first. Human beings are amazing creatures. We're so complicated, but simple. We have so many things about us that are just so amazing, including the very known fact that you can discover information, especially objective information, like math is math is math, okay? Like no matter, even if we've lost all this information, we'll find it again because it's just, it is what it is, right? It's an objective understanding of the world. Like this is what I'm seeing in the work that I do where I will come to a conclusion about my life. I'll be like, wow, I really feel like things are a construct or we're really having a disconnect between what do I owe society versus what do I owe myself? And then I'll read a thousand books and I'm like, ah, They've all these people before me who had the same experience I had and then made it into a philosophy and made it into a relationship with the self and wrote, you know, Tao Te Ching. I have it right here on my desk or, they, you know, the world is already doing what I'm doing and we're all doing it because that's why I am you and you are me. And it's really beautiful. And Dr. K goes into that where I think human beings have such an ego about them. So we come onto the planet and we think oh, I've done something no one else has done. One of the criticisms I get about my work is like Brittany thinks she's done something no one's done. no. What I, my, okay, my work is trying to prove the thing that's interesting to me is why don't we know we've already done it? Why don't we know that the answers to the universe are already out there? And then there's the other answers we're still looking for that I'm sure somebody's already discovered and we just don't have access to it. Or maybe it's like in the making, but we already know what to do. You know, sometimes I get a caller and they'll be like, tell me what to do. And I was like, you already know what to do though, right? And they're like, well, tell me what to do. And I'm like, but you already know what to do. Like you're telling it to me right now. Tell You just said the answer to me. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be a mirror and say it back to you. You already know what to do, but they just need that confirmation. So in life, like what we do is when we meet people, we're confirming reality with them. And that's why when you bubble hop, it can be really scary to be in front of somebody who's seeing life so differently from you because then you have to question your own reality and it, a bubble pops, right? And then you have to ask yourself like, okay, hold on, am I... Am I the one who's wrong or are you the one who's wrong? Well, it depends on what you mean by wrong. It depends on what your journey is there to figure out. Like if you're curious, be curious and explore. If you find yourself thinking, man, I don't know what to do with my life. Do something or do nothing. It doesn't matter, right? This idea that we're sitting here and drowning in like, what should I do with my life? You could try living it. No, it's not that. It can't be the answer, right? It's like, nope, that's the answer. <laughs> but okay. So yes, everything has been said before. I love that. Facts, all information already exists. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. And here we are rediscovering it time and time again because we go through cycles, right? So let's get into the video and you'll see how why I'm so excited to go over it with you and why I think it's just so, so interesting. And again, I am not telling you what to do with your life. I am trying to help you get where you want to go in your life, especially if you're in your 20s or 19, 18, you're just graduating school and you're like, what's next? Live your life, my bros. But what does that mean? Depends on the game you're playing. What are your goals, right? Like again, people get so afraid of like missing out or even after I talked to Smith, he was so sweet and he was, he, I was watching his stream after I left and he was saying things like, I just want to make sure Brittany isn't like, um. Like she's actually like doing things she want she wants in life, something like that. And I was like, oh, what a sweet gesture from somebody who's 10 years younger than me plus who thinks that, who doesn't understand that I am so, I'm doing literally everything I've ever wanted to do in my life to such an extent that I am 100% joyful and like that doesn't vary. And I'm looking at him like, oh, he did, like he has to understand like this is a projection of his own fear, right? And that's so fair for him because of where he's at. But my job has to have a professional 
balance between me and talking to my audience, right? So the internet is so inappropriate with boundaries that Smith is like, I'm afraid Brittany doesn't have a space to be herself. And I'm like, I'm afraid you guys are misunderstanding that this is my job. And if you go into the office and do not have a professional energy to you, you're being inappropriate. And I think that's the problem is people don't understand this is my full-time career. I'm very committed to making content that's good for my audience and doing what I want to do, which is like fulfilling my curiosity. But again, I think people who don't think of this as their full-time job think this is the place to make my journal. The internet is no longer my journal. The internet is a space where I get to bring my work to you and hopefully it helps you. But the internet is not my journal. We do not need to deep dive into Britney's life <laughs> like in that way. If you want to do a podcast interview and you want to make it fun and exploratory, I'm down. But like I don't I don't need to do therapy on the internet, right? Like I'm 34 years old. I've already gone through that journey in paid therapy, okay? But I think that's the thing that is so interesting about the internet is like we don't even know that being professional isn't about denying myself authenticity. It's about having a boundary. So okay, let's talk about this together. I'm so excited. All right, so you guys should be able to see it, yes. And let's make sure you can hear it. Um, so, so again, we're an hour and 10 minutes in. Please watch the full interview. I've already linked it, Discord, and in chat. And this video is with Dr. K and Destiny. Um, and they're talking about, well, Destiny wants to talk to Dr. K. But in particular, I just want you to see uh, how the conversation flows from here on out. He's about to check in with him. And, um, well, I'll show you why I found it so interesting. Let's watch. So where are you right now? What are you, what are you thinking? Thoughts, questions? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing down like big concepts, I guess, to keep track of. The first question of like, what does it mean to take a pill? I think that's a good, I think there's a lot of room for me to think about and explore how I feel about that because all of my feelings related to that are negative and most of them are, I think, really stupid. They're rooted in stupid things. <laughs> like I know that looking on it intellectually. Um, and then the... Um, why did I write this down? I wrote, you were talking about judgment in big caps. Oh, why do I judge myself, I guess? Or against like what standard do I judge myself? Um, I mean, I feel like judgment is probably a necessary part of, or you were going to no, say no, something. No, yeah, you know, I, I, I think you're, 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 okay, so let's talk about uh, pills for a second. Mm -hmm. So why do people have okay, stupid sure. beliefs, Stephen? Um, for all sorts of different reasons. Um, pr I mean, they could be maladaptive. Um, it could sure. be, uh, they learned no, no, it from I, other... I mean, like, why do people are, uh, develop stupid... Like, so you said, okay, I have all kinds of attitudes towards medication that are stupid. Then uh, why do you uh, have that attitude? Where does that attitude come from? Uh, it's probably an inherited belief that's largely unexamined because it doesn't come up much in daily life, basically, yeah. Okay, so I think that's one way to put it. I would chalk it up to an experience, which could be an inherit what you call an inherited belief, I think could be an experience, yeah, right? You my dad that. and my grandpa were like, right. I don't believe in medicine, I don't care about this, and then now I'm like, if I get a headache, I don't like to take ibuprofen or Advil, which is stupid, but it doesn't come up that much, so I don't examine it that much, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't... I, um, is he a real doctor? Dr. K is a real psychologist. He actually, um, YouTube actually gives here, I don't know if you guys can see it, but YouTube actually gives a disclaimer, says from a doctor licensed in the US. So it's actually like officializing his status as a doctor. I don't think it's an inherited belief. I think it's a learning is what I would call it. So even oh, though, sure. When I say inherited, I mean like it, you learn it, but you're right. Yeah, right, learn right. So you had, you had some sure. experience early on in life where like, you, like uh -huh. maybe you were sick and like the doctor. So Destiny or Steven is saying he grew up in a bubble where like medication was sort of looked down on. And so he internalized this belief system and he he like internalized it and now lived his life through it. So he's now 35 years old and for his own health is interested in engaging with pills to help his ADHD and is still harboring some shame around that because of the, the shame from the bubble. Remember, shame is when you've gone against the bubble and cultural expectation of behavior. And guilt is when you've betrayed your own values. And this is such an interesting idea. I think I grew up similarly to Stephen in terms of conservatism, where like a lot of growing up conservative is like, don't take pills, don't go to therapy, do it yourself, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And so I get to I totally get that relatable. And at the same time, it actually made me realize why Steven was always so weird about me smoking weed. And I was like, why are you so like anti weed? And I realized it's probably just his conservative background because he used to be like, hey, you shouldn't be smoking every day back when I was smoking every day. And I was like, oh, what a weird, I haven't heard that in so long, you know, because I've been around smokers for so long 
And I was like, oh, funny. But that's just that conservative bubble and that totally makes sense. I didn't smoke weed till I was 28 because I grew up conservative. So I get it. Um, but that makes a lot of sense that he'd be struggling with this. I'm really glad. I'm so glad he's fighting that upbringing to get himself help because like, girl, that's amazing, right? But Dr. K is pointing out a very real phenomenon that is so like bubbles related, culture related, how you're raised related, right? You were raised to think a certain way about a thing that it was made to help you, right? To be fair, Dr. K says the same thing about weed. Uh, I think the why is important here. Why does Dr. K say it versus why does Destiny say it? Right. So if Steven is saying, I don't even want to take ADHD pills, it makes me feel kind of bad. And Dr. K is saying, like, don't do weed because it's it's a um, Dr. K would say, don't do anything every day that distracts you from balance and meditation. Right. Or balance and, and enlightenment or balance. And so do you get what I'm saying? Like, there's a difference for the why. I think that's the difference is I would also say that don't smoke weed every day. Right. If it's not helping you, you know what I mean? What does it mean to smoke every day? Well, if you have chronic pain and cancer, we're not, it's a very different relationship than somebody else who's doing it as a crutch and as a cope, right? Doctor recommended that you take ibuprofen and you were really hurting and you were like, dad, should I take the ibuprofen? And he's like, ibuprofen is for sissies. You don't take ibuprofen. And then you felt guilty or bad because you really wanted it. And the doctor said, but you didn't want to be weak. Right. And then like that whole thing starts. I mean, I have no idea if that's actually what happened, but that's an example. Uh -huh. So I think one thing to okay, understand sure. anytime you examine your stupid beliefs is you can do the cognitive reframing stuff. But I have found it to be very, very helpful to understand the origins of your experience and why that became a truth for you. So again, the why it became a truth for him. So in relation to my work, I want you to take that line of thinking and think about why do you feel this way about leggings or a dress or women in pants or someone's hair color. And then I want you to expand it out all the way to the universe, all the way to creation. Why do you think you exist? Why do you think you're here? Why do you think anything about anything about anything? And that's what my work is covering. When I talk about the levels, I mean, if you're still just deciding, you know, should I take an, a pill like ibuprofen for my cramps? I'm a woman. Oh, my God. How many women can relate to this? How many people who get periods can relate to this, right? I don't need Advil. I don't need ibuprofen. I don't need Tylenol. I don't need pain kills, killers. Cramps don't even hurt. Women who complain about cramps, they're weak. I'm not weak. I'm not like those women right? There's a whole bubble where women will shame each other for feeling bad that they have cramps. I used to be one of those women in my 20s, my cramps weren't that bad. And I would literally make fun of women for being in pain because of their cramps because I was like, nah, I don't get pain from cramps. And now that I'm in my 30s, let me tell you, girl, not only were my cramps a motivator to make sure this was my full-time job so I never had to leave the house on my period? But now I'm like a complete baby about my cramps because they hurt, okay? And so again, like there's something so funny about life that way where you realize like, oh, bubble pop, what am I thinking? Why am I shaming people for being in pain? Because I myself am internalizing a shame attached to it because I am thinking it's shameful. And now I'm like, oh, that's so funny. Like I can't believe I thought that way. We all have moments like that. And I want to pop, uh, if you're interested in popping your bubbles, mm -hmm, you know, I want to pop as many bubbles as I can to have as many like, ooh, like, ooh moments, right? Like the other day when I popped my bubble and I was like, bugs are animals? Oh man, like what a weird idea. Like I never thought about bugs as animals because I didn't grow up with that language at all. I called them insects and insects I don't think of as animals and I put them in different categories and now I have to put animals and insects in the same category and I wasn't raised in that bubble and I know for some people that's like common knowledge but again we're not all raised in the same arenas we're not raised in the same bubbles so we're having different relationships with it right so again take the question that Dr. K just asked Stephen why do you think you have this feeling or thought around ibuprofen or pills, in this case, ADHD pills? And then I want you to expand it all the way out to the universe. Why do you even think you exist? And then remind yourself that every time you think you have the answer, your answer could be the direct cause of somebody else's pain and harm. So when we're looking at harm reduction, when we're looking at the conflicts that are around the world right now, and we see the way people murder each other en masse in the name of X, they justify it because, well, somebody hurt me and they hurt me and they hurt me first and then this hurt me. Because why? 
Why can't humans just put down all their weapons and stop hurting each other? Why can't we live in a universe where most people are literally, even more so than now, peaceful? Because right now, most people are peaceful, right? We're actually pretty great en masse. But what if we were even more great? What if we could be even more peaceful? Why can't we do that a little bit more? Should we be just grateful for where it's at now? Maybe. But that's the question you have to ask yourself. Why can't you just do it? And how that became a truth for you. Because at some point it, it was a, it was learned. That's why you believe it. Right? Uh-huh. Um, second thing about judgment is I think exploring the origins of your self-judgment are very important. And so if you really okay. want to, because right now what's happening is you have a clash between like a self-judgment and a logic. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Can we, let me, can I give you my idea about judgment first? So yeah. we're not using the same words. Or, yeah. Um, so I feel like judgment is a necessary part of your self-analysis because it allows you to more closely align yourself with whatever your idealized version with yourself is. So for instance, let's say that I think I should be somebody that is truthful to my friends around me. And then let's say that in the past I lied or I lied to somebody, then I would want to judge myself as failing to meet those types of expectations that I would have for a more idealized version of myself. Um, that would be what I would consider like a judgment. Sure. Not necessarily like, yeah, coming, but I just want to make sure we're using the word in the same way. So yeah, you can tell me that, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, so so I think the problem is that the the direction of the judgment and the idealized, what the target is, it can be based uh-huh. on bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? So you're right that judgment is a self-correcting. We have this part of our brain that does something called counterfactual thinking. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ingrid says, wait, wait, Kitty, wait, Kitty says bugs aren't sentient, so don't count them. What? Bugs are obviously alive. Wait, what do you mean they're not sentient? I don't know. My brother, Kles- my brother like has a farm of spiders and wasps. Everything that's like icky. Oh, this is so going to coincide later in the conversation. My brother is trying to get over all his fears. So he's cultivating like a relationship with wasps and spiders right now. And his whole idea is like, well, I'm afraid of them. So I'm going to have a relationship with them. So now he has a whole farm of spiders in his room, which is insane. You know what I mean? And, and he's doing wasps now. And I'm like, it sends me videos all the time. And I'm like, Ooh, Ooh, I don't like insects, but like, that's what he's doing. Right. Cause he's like, okay, how do I face myself? Like, this is literally the family I grew up in for all of its faults was also a very big, like face your fears family. And so it's just interesting. Um, it's so interesting. Cause like I, Ooh, bugs, but then I've had tarantulas on me. Like I remember when I was in my like teens, I was doing this haunted house and the guy had a tarantula and he asked me if he could put it on my head and it could walk around my body. And I was like, sure. And so he did that. Right. And I was like, okay. And like, I can do, sp- I can do tarantulas. I can do snakes. I can do, um, scorpions. I can do lots of different things, but certain little, the little ones, Ooh, the little bugs. <laughs> thinking which is and it's Uh kind of a weird term but when we make a mistake there is a factual representation of what happened and we have a Uh part of our brain that thinks in a counterfactual way so you could think Mm, sorry i just want to say like how powerful your brain is that you can logic yourself out of doing what's good for you right like i think we all know what we need to do in life like if you're in a very unhealthy state of being you know there's like a path to what is healthy like you know that unhealthy and healthy exists, right? Like eventually at some point in your life, you know the words healthy and unhealthy. So you know they're like the opposites and you know one is good and one is bad, right? So it's funny how we all know what we need to do, but then how we logic our way out of it. And that's why the logic is so dangerous because you can logic your way to a Holocaust. You can logic your way to genocide. You can logic your way to a lot of cruel and awful things. So I want us to be very careful not to logic our way to very destructive behavior, right? Which is why sensitivity and emotions do need to come in to remind ourselves like we're human. We do not need to be hurting each other this way. We should be kinder and better to one another, right? Start with the baby steps. Start with considering people's consent. Start with maybe not lying to yourself so you don't have to lie to other people. Start with like the baby steps and then we can talk about stopping war you know what i mean think about it as hypothetical but our brain Uh goes back and rewrites history outside of the facts and that is one of the Uh ways that we learn from our mistakes and correct our behavior so you're right that i think Uh judgment is uh 
it's a judgment that you place that has the direction towards an idealized self. But the problem is that that idealized self and that judgment can come from unhealthy places to begin with. So what yeah, I'm saying definitely is I agree. that's what needs to be examined. Right. Okay. And, and that's then, what then I guess the question would be like, is the ideal that you're aspiring to unhealthy to some extent? I feel Absolutely. like that's what the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then that, then we get to the, the big, big problem of like, I, I think like, so I think you've come up with a very intellectually sound, dharmic, ethical, utilitarian approach to what you want to do with your life. Uh -huh. But that's all coming from up here. And what I'm really hearing you need to do is integrate that with like the other parts of your mind. Okay. So right here, when I say like there are different parts of us, like when I say, oh, the part of Brittany, that's this. When I say I want to know everything about my body, how does my pinky toe feel? How does my left nostril feel? Like how does the hair follicles feel? My, you know, I want to know everything. It's because we are everything. We are this whole thing. Like, in some ways, I think my consciousness is being like held by this body, this form I'm in. And then another part of me knows like it's all connected. Another part of me thinks I'm my brain, but I also know I'm my body. And so you have to realize like you are the sum of all these parts. And so sometimes people go, I'm just going to be really logical or I'm going to be completely emotional and in my body. Or some people are like, I'm just, you know, everyone picks and chooses. And that's the idea around balance. I think that goes missing in the conversation and then we moralize it oh I'm better than you because I cry I'm better than you because I never cry it's like okay just okay facts Brittany I want to know every detail every detail I want to know everything I just want to and then like I said we're still discovering so many things about the brain as it is and the body that I will never be my curiosity will never be satisfied until the day I die and after thank goodness I'll never be bored because we'll always be solving this mystery right yin and yang and we're all connected exactly yeah of course right because I, I think that's where you're going to find your balance because right now there's a conflict which means that one side is going to win and one side is going to lose mm -hmm. uh -huh. or well ideally it, one side is integrated into the other if there's uh, if you run into a huge incongruence with the the mind and the feeling at some point you have to examine why and then bring one of them into alignment with the other at some point, right? Yeah, so I think Hopefully. in that integration process, one piece is going to lose. Okay. Mm, okay, hold on. Uh, Ingrid says, it's impossible to know everything, which, okay, at one point in my life, I was like, oh no, it's impossible to know everything. And I'm like, ooh, it's impossible to know everything, which means I'll never be bored, which means I'm going to have a very exciting and awesome life. And I think that that, pers like that perspective and changing that perspective is kind of key and then being really honest with it. Not the full, like there's a performative stage in it when you're going on the journey. There's like a performative part where you're like, everything is a mystery. How exciting. And it's kind of performative. And then there's a real part of you that's like, oh man, I'm never going to be, I'm literally could never be bored. So if you look to my life now, you might be like, oh, Brittany has like this little boring life where she stays inside all day because now I'm on the second part of the journey, which is like I physically did all these things here. So I've satisfied all of that like uh, FOMO or missing out or like doing things in person. And now I'm going back into the research stage where I'm just reading and consuming and watching and doing all these other things. And then eventually I'll take what I've read and understood and move back into action again. It goes and flows, right? You go from the research stage to the doing stage, to the research stage to the doing stage, because there comes a point in the research stage where like you just got to do now. Now you just got to live your life. Right. And so it's very excited, like exciting. And I think that getting to that place is so magical. And there's like there's something about that that's so great. And I wish people could just be excited to learn new things. But the problem is, is like we get stuck on the old things. And we get stuck on the constructs. We literally get stuck on the construct of God. We get stuck on the construct of belief. We get stuck We get stuck on the construct of whether or not people should wear pants or certain colors or eat certain foods. Like we literally make up a rule. We like make it up. One day someone's like, we're not going to eat pork. And everyone's like, okay. And then one guy eats pork and they're like, kill that guy. And I'm like, what the fuck? Hey, we're not going to be gay. That's not going to be a thing. And it's like, okay, kill the gay per. It's like, bro, can we just chill, please? But we can't because it's like one day somebody just comes up with a rule. They're like, eh, we're not going to do that anymore. And it's like, you know, and again, if fear is the reason you're not going to do something, then there's a problem with that, right? Fear is the root of all evil. Now, again, 
sometimes we have conversations on this channel like about age gap relationships where there's always like that fear. Like recently I saw on TikTok, I don't know much about the story because I was like watching some of the videos of a trans woman who was recently killed by an 18 year old that found out she was trans and killed her. But the 18 year old was still in high school. And a part of me is like, what are you doing with a high schooler? And everyone's like, who cares? She's dead. And I was like, yeah, but like, did he end up killing a child predator? Because like, less sad about that. But if it's actually like, it is a hate crime, but also he was in high school. And I know he was 18, but he's in high school. What is a 40 year old person doing with a 18 year old? And so a part of me is like, I hold this biased thought where a part of me is like, did we just get rid of one more child predator? Because like, I'm kind of okay with that. And then another part of me is like, don't say that out loud because that's like violent, right? And I don't want to be violent, but that's a part of my DNA as a human. We are all fighting like a form of violence, right? And so I want, I have to ask myself, I have to be introspective and say like, why do I have this thought? Well, I'm afraid kids are going to get hurt. And I'm like, well, how do I protect kids? Probably not by violence. Probably, probably not by violence, right? Like that's probably not the answer. But it, as a human, like that's where my brain goes. And so you have to fight that animal nature to just destroy the thing that scares you. Instead, you have to rewire yourself and meditate with yourself and say, okay, how do I find peace even when I'm disturbed? How do I go for things that are ethical even when I'm disturbed? You know, we have to challenge ourselves in this. This is us. When we have a problem with society, it's a problem with us. People say, oh, how can people hurt these people? How can you hurt these people? Think of the people you want to hurt right now. We're in such denial that we want to hurt people because we think we're doing it for good reasons. Oh, no, no. But my person that I want to hurt, it's a good reason. Is it? Is it a good reason? And maybe it is. Maybe you can justify it to me. Maybe you're right. But remember, when we look at the world and we say, how can they want to hurt people? Think, make a list right now of all the people you would justify hurting and tell me that they're not doing the same thing that they're not just justifying in their head, oh, but I know the actual people we should be hurting and everyone else is wrong and I'm the one who's right. You know what I mean? Okay, says facts. The construct is just a container we use to try to describe a larger phenomenon that we call we can all call experience. True. True. We can never know everything. I'm super open to believing bugs have feelings, by the way. I wasn't, oh, okay, good. Now we know. Bugs might have feelings. <laughs> I think, I think they must, right? I feel like they do have feelings. I don't know though. Cause like, I don't know. I feel bad. Now I feel worse for killing bugs. I do. Both are wrong, but murder is worse. Yeah. Murder is pretty bad. I don't know if murder is worse. I, cause honestly, if it like in my head, even though it was legal, what was happening, an adult taking advantage of a child feels worse to me in some ways than murder because at least in murder they don't have to live with the memory but like if you're alive you have to live with the memory this is something that I face with my own like like struggles with mental health because obviously like there's always that question would you rather be assaulted or live and it's like why are we talking about these things like they're not both horrific and in my head it's almost worse to like live because then you have to deal with the trauma but then, of course, people are very grateful to be alive. So we can't say that it's worse to be alive. And so it's always just personal and subjective about what is worse or not worse. Right. You know. I disagree. Or let's talk about that, actually. Yeah, because I feel like I don't agree with that 100 um, percent. I'll give an example and then you can talk me through why you think that. I'm curious. Um, so let's say that. Um, let, let's say that I feel like uh, I should. Um, Shoot, I don't want to use like, well, no, we'll say a negative thing, okay? Um, let's say that I want to play video games for 16 hours a day. But like intellectually, I know that it's probably not healthy to play video games for 16 hours a day. But I really like playing video games. So at some point, um, I ration this out to like, well, I think playing like one or two hours a day, maybe. That's healthy. Like I would view that as a sort of compromise where I don't know if I would say one side is lost or not, but maybe you would frame it as like one side is lost, like the emotional side of wanting to play for. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Right. Because one side of you wants to play for 16 hours a day. Mm hmm. Like if we but like to, maybe the intellectual side wants to play for like zero hours a day, like don't play video games. Sure. At all, but then so you both, like both anytime that... you integrate or compromise, both sides lose. Right. Okay, that's how you. Okay, sure. Okay, gotcha. Right. So, so my point is that there, there's a different way, and I think it's fine. What you've done is awesome. Like, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I think like the higher you climb on the uh -huh. MMR scale, the harder things get, and the more subtle they become. Right. 
So I, I think okay. there's there's another way to go about this. I just feel like this is perspective. So it depends on how you want to see it in the moment. Which is to metabolize the root of why do I want to play 16 hours a day in the first place? So Dr. K goes to the root and most people just tackle the surface. And that's not bad. I think we're trained to tackle the surf surface. We're not tracked. We're like not trained to go down to the root, the actual root of the problem, because the root is much harder. You have to dig for it, right? Like, okay. So obviously we want to go for the root, but the root is very difficult, right? It's why the world will always be in conflict because nobody wants to tackle the root of it, which is fear. Generalizing here, but I always think like fear is the root of all evil. Hello. So every time we see the evil in the world, I'm like, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of that's making you do this? What are you afraid of that you're playing 16 hours a day of video games without turning it into something productive, right? Because I'm all about playing 16 hours of video games a day if it's productive. If you're at work and you're streaming and you're making money, I'm about it. But if you're also in the like in the process of doing this, like neglecting your family or something like that, maybe we'll have like a con like a conversation about that, right? Like there's something. And remember, like life is tiny contradictions. Kay says every time Destiny thinks there's a contradiction. Oh, wait, sorry. It was interesting seeing Destiny swing between extreme understandings of these topics and Dr. K trying to pull him back to the middle. Yeah, this and this is true. Every time Destiny thinks there's a contradiction. I mean, life is tiny contradictions. So to be fair, he's probably using his own understanding. And he's like, because he's not like he doesn't come from the perspective of Dr. K. I don't even think Dr. K is exactly the perfect person to talk to Steven because Dr. K is more, I think, like into the spiritual and into the knowledge of alternative living. So I think it's it's hard because like I feel like Dr. K's work is so good. But often I think that he's trying to meet Steven like with his like technical language. But I wonder if he's the right, like I wonder like who would be the right person to get Steven's brain to go click, 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 click. Like where's the language here? Um, it's interesting, but I also think the answers to this are somewhat spiritual. That's why I say I'm an atheist, but I'm spiritual. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm an atheist, but I believe in the metaphysical. Like I'm an atheist, but I know there's like unexplained phenomenons that are happening that are less woo woo and more just like, I think a fact, a part of the universe that's unexplained. Right. And so call that woo woo, call it God, call it prayer. I just think it's probably a phenomenon that can't be explained yet. You know, so it's interesting. Like, I'm open, but I have boundaries, right? So, like, I'm not going to worship no God. That's not going to happen, girl, please. Even if they're real, like, I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to worship, okay? <laughs> but I'm saying, like, if a God existed, I think it would be like an anime God where, like, it's inconsequential that it exists. I That's my theory on God is, like, I don't think it matters that God is real if it's real. Which, like, aliens. Does it matter if aliens are real? Like, what does it really change? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, does it change anything? Now, if I find out a specific God was real, like, oh, we were wrong and actually like Allah is real or Jesus Christ is real or like X God is real, maybe we'll have a conversation about action after that. But in general, like even the concept of a God existing, it doesn't mean it's going to come forth like the God we imagine. What if it's like an inconsequential God? What if it's an indifferent God and we just decided we needed a leader so we worshiped a thing? Like think about Moses in the desert. How Moses went to go get the Ten Commandments. And when he came back, Aaron and everybody had created false gods because they literally were so impatient. They literally saw the Red Sea part and they were like, mm, I feel like our God's taking too long. So we're just going to make a statue and make a different God. I was like, oh, my God, you're so bored. You are so bored. They created a God. The story out of the Bible itself is that God saved the Israelites parted the red fucking sea for them. They saw it happen. And because Moses took too long getting some 10 commandments, they were like, I know what to do. Let's create a golden calf. And everyone's like, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. We should do that. And I'm like, what? Like they literally have no patience. And so I just think like God is this construct, right? Where we create him because we're bored. And it's amazing to me. It's just like the most beautiful thing to watch, even in their own history right? It's beautiful. I think Dr. K was the perfect person. He understands Destiny's logic brain, video games, and he can bring in the spiritual stuff. Yeah, we'll see. I think the spiritual stuff always throws Steven for a loop, though. I think it really is, like, hard. I love being an atheist who chooses to accept the metaphysical. Me too, Hada. Vibes. Vibes. Ugh, yeah. Vibes, vibes, vibes. Okay. It's not about reconciling two parts. It's about getting to the source of like, what does 16 hours a day mean to me? What's important about this? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then as you get down that road, something cool happens, which is that the desire kind of melts away. And then you're sort of <laughs> left without either side. 
And then you're kind of like, you can just sort of make a choice and you're not being like driven by these two different things. Sure. Can you um, expand on that when you say the desire melts away? Like, can you think your way through wanting to ever play video games? <gasps> Thank you, Z King. Welcome to memberships. The Dolma video is made. I just need to edit it. It will be up this week for memberships on level um, open with boundaries. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Can you expand on that? Theoretically, you can think your way through that. Um, uh -huh. there, is a, there is a subset of the practice of yoga. I'm not talking about the postures. I mean like the traditional meaning of the word yoga, which is like paths to enlightenment, called jnana yoga, which is the yoga of knowledge. So one major okay. text of that is this text called the Brahma Sutra, which is like a text that talks about logical argument. So it, it talks, it, it's like a text on argument, basically. But uh -huh. there are, it, theoretically, it is possible. It, it's more, it, it's not logic, it's more contemplation. And then like, if you kind of think about, uh, so, so theoretically, maybe it's possible. It's something that I, when I was learning, I was taught that this is the hardest path of yoga of which there are very, very few true yogis who like really know how to do this anymore. Um, Cause it's not logic, uh -huh. it, it's contemplation. But the other way that I would think about it is, um, is so does, first of all, does that answer your question or, or what was your question? Um, what do you mean when you talk about like the dissolution of desire, yeah. I guess? I, I, I kind of thought it was gonna be, I don't know if there was like a, oh, well, when you just do this, but yeah, I've yeah. heard of like the, the far more complicated ones, right? Yeah, go ahead. But, but, but yeah, but the, 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 there is absolutely a dissolution of desire. So like this, this okay. is where things get kind of cool, which is like the more that you explore the origin of yeah, whatever your desires are, the more you will discover that there is nothing at the bottom. Okay. Right, so we, we assume that the things that we want are like real Keep. but like once you realize the origin of the want you realize that oh this is like not a real thing it's just so like just to give you a simple example uh -huh. um oh my god i'm so excited right now let's say i want to play a particular video game so i've been on the fence about buying starfield because okay. i don't know right and so if I really look at, okay, do I want to buy the game? Do I not want to buy the game? I draw a logical argument about reasons to buy Starfield, reasons to not buy Starfield. And I can go back and uh -huh. forth, but the real antidote to that is like, why do I want Starfield in the first place? What am I looking for? And the more and more I go into myself, the more I realize, okay, like, what is the origin of my desire for Starfield? I saw an ad about it. What is the origin of my desire? I saw people talking about it. What is the origin of my desire? Oh, like, I... I enjoyed playing Morrowind and Oblivion so much that I long for that experience again. And then as I sit down and- Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay, I have to tell you, my partner and I had one of these conversations the other day where he was like, why? And I was like, what do you mean why? He's like, why? And I was like, and then I gave an answer and he's like, no, why? And I was like, oh no. And we dug, we, he asked me why like a hundred times. And every time I thought I had the answer, he's like, no, why? And I was like, oh, he's like, mm -mm. and I was like, oh, and like, it's so fun to have somebody ask you this question because this, this is the, this is the why training is very difficult because every time you ask yourself why you think you have the answer. Oh, why do you like this kind of porn? Oh, cause the girls are hot. Why? Why what? Why are the girls hot? Um, cause I like looking at them. Why? Oh, um, they make me feel good. Why? It's like every time you ask yourself a question, you could stop at any level of the answer of why. And my job, my excitement is to go down to the deepest why as much as I can, which is very difficult. And even I sometimes hit a roadblock and I'm like, fuck, I don't know. Like I, this is, oh my God, why? So every time I look at a problem, I imagine a spider web. I tell my callers this, imagine you have a spider web and it's all the strands have clunked together. Every time you figure out a why, you're slowly unraveling like a really sticky web. It's really difficult. It's really delicate. It's really special. And then you have to literally do this as many times. So when I have a problem and I'm problem solving, I'm like, why? And everyone goes, oh, this is the answer. I'm like, no, that's not good enough. I want to know the root of the why. So when I'm problem solving, you can always tell I talk about it a lot. You know what I mean? You guys probably know like some of the problems I've been re recently solving where I'm like, what the, f why? Because the why is not, the answers you usually get are all the superficial answers. It is not what's on the surface, right? 
The surface is the distraction. I want to know the root of the why. But again, it sounds simple. Oh, I just want to buy this video games. And I'm like, no, like it doesn't just happen that way, right? The video game was created and it was created by somebody else. And then you came across the video game. That's the basics of philosophy. Why? Exactly. Why, why, why? That's all I care about is the why. So again, like, why do you love this person? Why do you do this thing? Why is this? And everyone always goes for the easiest answer. And the easiest answer is a good cope. It's a really good band-aid. It's really satisfying. And most of the world is fine with the cope. But for those of us that are like, eh, not good enough because we need it. Like I needed it for my mental health. Me thinking I just had depression and anxiety wasn't good enough. I could have lived my whole life without getting diagnosed, diagnosed with PTSD and borderline. I could have lived my whole life. I had a job. I had partners. I had friends. I had communities. People loved me. I could have lived my whole life like internalizing my problems and self-harming and being like a internally like battling person all the way into my death. But I couldn't do it anymore. I had to ask myself like, why is this happening? And when I finally got my answers, I was like, cool, how do I stop it, right? Like, how do I have a better relationship with it? So again, I love this like attempt Dr. K is making at explaining something that is so simple, but it's so hard to do. The easy answer is such a boring one. And you know what's so funny? The right answer could also feel like a boring one, right? It's so, it's so Oh, I love this part. I love this part of discovering. I love this part of philosophy. I love this part of asking yourself why. Why? Why? That's why I don't like exactly modern day philosophy or philosophy groups being like, I'm a stoicist. I'm a Randian. I'm an objectivist. I'm an... It's like, okay, you're like, why? Oh, because those ones make me feel good about myself. Why? Oh, because then I don't have to think very hard. Now I have this label I adapt to. Why? Oh, because, you know, Okay, how do you stop yourself from making reasons up? Ooh, well, you don't. You usually, you can make the reason up. So let's say you ask yourself like why, okay, and you come up with a reason. It's not going to be good enough if you keep digging. You're going to find out it's a fake reason, right? Um, Vox, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Who told you to be this beautiful today? (laughs) stop it right now I'm actually trying out a new hairdo thank you it's actually not really new it's just my hair's grown out different so now I feel like I look different today thank you appreciate appreciate you thank you so much um but yeah I think like if you start digging into the why even the answers you make up will eventually dissipate but that's the problem nobody does that everyone always goes for the first answer they get they go ah that's it yep why is my wife mad at me ah she's a woman (laughs) <laughs> why is my husband mad at me? Ugh, men. Or is it something deeper and more interesting, right? You know what I'm saying? And I engage in some degree of like reflection and contemplation. Okay, so like I've had things that I enjoyed in the past. Do I want to hold on to that? I don't need to. That was, I can just appreciate that exists, that, that for what it is. And it's kind of weird, but at like the end of that process, there's just nothing there. Is there... Is it necessarily good to dissolve all of your desires? I don't know for how Buddhists we're getting, but like the the, the counterclaim I'm gonna say is like, well, what if you have a desire to be like a good father or a good parent? Like, would you want to drill it, down? This pay attention. This is such an important part. Pay attention. Oof. Yeah, go ahead. it depends on what your goal is. So when you say good, how what how are you defining that end zone? Good, um, normatively, morally, like it sounds like dissolving a desire to partake in a vice is tautologically good because vices are bad. And if you can dissolve your desire to have a vice, you've done something good, right? We move away from vice. And- okay, really fast. So when normies hear me talk and they're not in the like spiritual metaphysical bubble or the philosophy bubble, and I say like, there is no meaning, everything is meaningless. They hear like depression and anxiety and dread and existential hate. They hear or existential dread. They hear like self-hate. They hear like, oh my God, Brittany's like, Brittany's crazy. And I'm saying, no, dude, like mean it in a Buddhist way, but I also mean it in like a nothing matters. So every time we decide to be upset about something, every time I decide to be upset about something, I'm making a judgment of making it matter. 
and I'm making a decision to invest in the construct and I'm making a decision to fuel the fire. And every time I decide to deny myself the understanding of nothing matters, I'm like making a decision of what's important. When I say like, oh, I want to get better at my job so I can make more money. I am saying what matters to me is playing this game called money so I can have this life here, even though it doesn't matter. Because as a five, of course, it doesn't matter. But as a two, of course, it matters. And I'm playing in a world of two. I'm playing this game. Nihilism is an important uh, step onto the path of true optimism. Agree. Agree. And I think there's two nihilism and I think there's four nihilism. And I agree. I think it's so important. But people have to understand there's something after that. So Destiny, even now, Stephen, even now goes, because he doesn't know. Like if Dr. K said that to my audience, I think most of you would be like, ah, oh, yeah, I get it. But Stephen needs the clarifier because Stephen's not reading about Buddhist philosophy or he's not reading about certain things or he's not consuming an, enough of a lived experience. I would argue that I more lived a lot of this than even read about it, right? Because um, I didn't even deep dive into Buddhist philosophy and I'm still just learning about it now, but I had lived an experience of losing everything, losing my sense of like consciousness and zooming out of my body and feeling like, oh my gosh, what? Steven needs to ask this question because he's not there yet, which is so great. Like love a journey, love watching a journey. How, how lucky are we to watch a journey, right? And Dr. K is trying to explain to him a concept that I think 90% of my audience would be like, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. because like, you know what I mean? We're on that. Like, it's so, fa I, mm, I feel so lucky that we get to watch. It's so exciting. Towards virtue. Um, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. Good. You've made yourself a better person. Improved your character, I guess. And yeah, and I just want to say, yes, like, oh, Dr. Keith's about to explain. Hold on. We'll watch it. We'll watch. It's so good. So I'm going to say, so a couple things. The first is that there okay. are, th there's a subset of, of spiritual practitioners called Agori Babas. Gor okay. means fear. Aghor okay. means lack of fear. So these are people okay. who intentionally engage in vice-like behavior as part of their spiritual progression. Now, okay. in this case, vice-like behavior includes marijuana, eating of meat, even cannibalism in some cases. Okay. I, need, I have a story about this. Are you listening? This is... <sighs> this... Oh, my God. When I was 19 years old and I was questioning the Catholic faith... So I'm 34. When I was 19, I came across this group he's talking about. I was researching into monks and I was I was reading about people who were who were facing and consuming their vices or interacting with things that were their fears. And I came across this group of people who dig up graves, engage in cannibalism, drink their own urine, sleep outside. I became my bubble popped everything about my life just like whoop, whoop. and I was like what and once I learned about this group of people on the planet my whole life away from Catholicism shifted severely like my mom and dad will think oh it's the liberal media it's the gays it's whatever it was literally learning about people on the other side of the world having a relationship that was so far from my understanding just so far from my own understanding of life and like what was good for you and so that triggered my journey into just doing everything I could do within reason that was scary or dangerous or interesting, you know, from drugs to skydiving to multiple jobs to moving out to living off zero dollars to doing whatever it took for me to experience some sort of like a bubble hopping without even knowing I was bubble hopping, right? So here I was like trying everything out for like everything out that I could like from Everything that I could try, everything that I can consume, everything that I could. I think it is the tribe from Wild Boys. Isn't Wild Boys with Steve-O? I think it's the same group. I'm almost positive it's the same group. It's fascinating. It's just the most interesting thing. My my brain blew up. When I heard Dr. K say that, I was like, doo, doo. it was like my life. Like, I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I am having this lived experience that shifted my whole perspective my whole perspective on life, but it didn't do enough for me to hit like five or three or two. Like I was still in two bubble guys. I was still blowing my own mind and I was still just like on the other side of like this bubble. I wasn't actually, um, I wasn't actually, uh, I wasn't actually 
facing my own mortality or thinking about my consciousness in like a really profound way. I was just thinking about it like, oh my gosh, I'm like this virginal Catholic girl and I'm really discovering like someone's living their whole life by consuming their vices. Like, whoa, whoa, right? Like changed my whole life. And now that's what we're going to do later tonight. We're going to bubble hop into, well, assume, well, we'll see how long it takes us to get through this video, honestly. But it is one of those things where Again, we're like bubble hopping into other people's worlds. Every time you watch a video, you're not just watching someone who's crazy. You're watching someone who's you in a different life. Not you literally, but like you could have been. Like that's another way you could live. When you're traveling, when you're looking at the conflicts around the world, you could have been on either side. This privileged position of looking at people instead of being people, but forgetting like they're looking at us the same way. I'm an American in Europe. They are looking at me the way Americans look at Europeans. Oh, the Europeans are so weak and fragile. And Europeans are looking at us like, oh man, Americans are so weak and fragile. <laughs> they're so sensitive and they're all their emotions. They shoot each other up at their schools. Oh my God, look at Americans. They get angry at you and they run you off the road. Like, look at Americans. Like, you know what I mean? It's fascinating. Um, and and okay. they actually intentionally expose themselves to negative things to try to transcend this like tautological idea of like good and bad. And this is what I used BDSM for. This is what I used BDSM for. When I did BDSM, and I know all you guys think it's crazy, BDSM was my meditative practice. It was my version of this. Doing things that were like uh, vices or bad for me, like getting peed on, doing like rope bondage, getting whipped, getting punched, um, experiencing needle play, ha like breath play, like doing all these things that normies certainly aren't doing in everyday life. But if I could go into the right bubble, I could try a thing that could get me to know myself better. This is what I used BDSM for. I'm all about using BDSM for orgasm and sex. That's great. But for me, also, most of my practice in the last 10 years plus of doing it, 12 years plus of doing it, has been for meditative practices. Because again, like, I don't actually want to eat dead bodies. But would I create a scene where it felt like I was doing something similar? Yeah. Kitty says, I was literally going to say that's why I do BDSM. A fucking men. Okay. So they, they, they drink alcohol and get high and eat fish and meat and sleep in cemeteries and, yep. and stuff like that. So there, there's a spiritual path that kind of does that. But then the goal there is that this is this idea that this tautology between good and bad is actually like a human construction. Yep. And that it's it, that it's not a real thing, that there that it's kind of this non-dualism, non which is like a philosophical view that most mm -hmm. of the yoga practitioners kind of take it's the dominant school that has emerged historically mm -hmm. okay so so uh, first thing is that uh, there's a perspective that taut tautologically good and bad is not a real thing and it's just these are judgments that we make right and we know that good and bad exactly so when i talk about cheating okay i Brittany, in my construct of a bubble think cheating is bad because it's a consent violation but it is also the journey of a human being to deceive themselves and then to deceive others. And so much like I'm not angry at the bear for eating the Alaskan fisherman, but I'm upset at the circumstance that led the bear and the fisherman to meet. I am not in one way upset that people cheat because it's life. People cheat, especially given into temptation. Like that's what happens, right? So... I'm upset that the circumstance was created and temptation was bought into and cheating occurred, right? That's what people have to understand. I, Brittany, and my little two bubble of values that I've created, or even in my five bubble, I've created this value where we don't do this, has such a strict relationship with it because it's denying the temptation and accessibility into it. So when people tell me like, oh, like you could cheat, you know, it's like, Yes, given all of these things going wrong, even I could cheat, but that means 70 things went wrong that I failed in to get to the point where that happened. Mental health um, declined, I'm in psychosis, I'm intoxicated under like an insane amount of drugs or narcotics, like 
lots of bad things could happen, but I, Brittany, the consciousness who believes in free will and is engaging with it, would have to engage in that behavior in such a pattern that would lead me down a path to engaging with such bad behavior and bad because of the construct I've created, not bad because it's objectively bad. If you zoom out into the lens of the universe, humans cheating, killing each other, genocide, that's all natural, baby. Nothing is bad because if you zoom out, the universe not only does not care about us, but we are part of the universe. A meteor coming down into earth and shattering our planet is nature, baby. Everything we do is nature. Every time we hurt someone, every time we assault somebody, every time we blow up a country, that's nature, baby. But the question is, are we going to be aware and accept that that's life and this is what happens? And also, can we do something different than our nature? And that's the engagement of free will. When you engage with free will, you're saying, I'm going to go even against what the universe has planned for me or my God has planned for me or anything else, right? That's just one way. Oh, hold on. Let's read some comments here. Um, uh, oh, okay, never mind. You guys are having your own conversations. I love that. Keep it up, guys, in the comments. But you guys get what I'm saying? Everything, it, like what is good, what is bad, right? What is What does it even mean? It means I am uncomfortable with the thing that human beings do. And I would like us to harm reduce, but you see how I'm not asking everyone to get rid of harming because it's impossible, right? Love this. Bad changes over time because people used to think something is good. Now they think it's bad. So what's really good or bad? Okay. Second thing is uh, from a more practical perspective, I think that for 99%... Sorry, does Dr. K's spiritual beliefs exclude him from being a five? No, I don't think so. All fives can have a spiritual belief. They can have a belief in or a belief in religion. It's whether or not they think it's objective or it's a belief, right? Because what we know and what we believe, those are two different things. Those are just two different things. So again, it's the why. So I hold spiritual beliefs, right? And to people moving on this path will improve their life in a significant way. But if you really look at the precision of it, huh? abandoning desire makes you not a good citizen in the world of life. Oof, listen so to this. if your goal is to break free of the cycle of suffering and to become huh? enlightened and achieve whatever your highest human potential is, which can be uh -huh. viewed as virtuous and there's a whole fun angle there listen to this right so like but as you become more and more enlightened like you don't behave the way that a normal person will generally speaking i think that like i said for 99 percent of the times that's good but let's remember uh -huh. that like when buddha started his journey on his enlightenment and also became enlightened he, he basically abandoned his wife and child and kingdom and okay. pursued something else listen to this Th this is what I'm trying to explain to you. People always ask me, like, is being a five lonely? Um, being a five is the least lonely of the journey into, like, enlightenment and all that stuff, right? Like, I think, again, depending on what part of the journey you're on, right? I always think there's a further journey. Like, I always joke, like, I want to be good at my job now so I can breathe later. And when I say breathe later, I mean meditate. I mean seek out that other path. I don't want to abandon my child. I don't want to abandon my husband. I don't want to abandon my job. I am not a person who's willing to abandon every bubble to go into this, this truly secluded bubble. The closest I can get to it is going into my home now and having moments with just my partner and I. So the only part of life that I'm truly distracted by right now is my job, which I love, and my husband. But then even my family and friends, like it's less. We're having less communication right now because I'm just like, and this is the closest, right? So I don't want to be a person who abandons everybody in my life to have the greatest job, to have the greatest meditation. And that's why I say, if you're going to go on a meditative journey, really pay attention to what you're, to how lonely it can be. I do think the path to five gets lonelier in terms of community, but not really. I think you just jump back into bubbles that you like. Like, you know, even Smith was saying like, um, oh, I'm concerned, um, Brittany's like mirroring too much. I'm not mirroring like in the medical way, but I am like hopping into a bubble and bringing out the version of Brittany that like wants to talk about queer rights. But like when I'm not talking about queer rights, because that's a bubble and a construct created because of um, oppression, when I'm just in my safe space and I don't have to worry about oppression, 
well, now I can meditate or I can do other things or I can seek enlightenment in a different version or I can meditate for 10 hours. You know what I'm saying? Every time you're busy thinking about how oppressed you are, you're not thinking about anything else. You know what I'm saying? So again, for me, when I think about what Dr. K is saying, I'm thinking about what sacrifices am I willing to make to go into, to go to that journey, which is like basically a solo journey, right? And now that I have a person with me, I might die never going on that journey, which I'm okay with. I've actually, I'm okay with it, girls, because like I already know it's there if I want it and I already know that I'm good where I am. But if I wanted that journey, I could go down that journey, right? And that's pretty exciting. But also I'm good where I am and I think that's the point of being in joy is that you're just happy where you are because it's exactly where you're supposed to be, good or bad, right? I know I'm supposed to be here. Even when I was going through it a few months ago, I'm like, ooh, I know what part of the journey this is and it's gonna happen again. It's gonna come in waves and I'm gonna be another part of stressful journey. I'm like, ooh, but at least I don't lose my joy. And just getting there was everything. If I could just get people to their joy, whether they're twos or fives, like I feel like I would be in a way fulfilled and I could make money and we could make this cycle work for me, right? Because I do wanna, you know, have a certain standard of living. I don't wanna live out in the woods and be like on a mountainside humming, like that's not my life right now. That's not where I'm supposed to be. Maybe in the future though, I definitely want to build my life up to have that be a future without me abandoning everyone around me. So I think that's really important, right? And again, I was just listening to Graham Stephan in his podcast talk about this where this guy was saying, um, you know, he decided not to have kids with his wife and he's building a business and said he's worth like $100 million. And he's saying, I could, have a kid, but I can't be present in that kid's life. I've decided to make a company. So I'm going to be kind of a bad dad. But like also I wouldn't want to deny my wife the chance at motherhood if she wanted to be a mom. And I think there's something about that that people don't understand. Like to be a parent that's a good parent. And I think like to be a good parent, you have to be present. It does mean you can't just go meditate in the mountains. Now you can and your kids can be like, oh, my parents are cool. They meditate in the mountains. And maybe your kid is okay with it. Maybe. But probably not, right? That would be an anomaly. That would be rare, right? That would be weird. Most people need a certain amount of structure because like we're humans and we're evolved animals and we need certain types of basic care. And so again, you know, we won't know until we know until we know until we do different things. But it's it's so fascinating. Like this this whole concept is so interesting to me. Oh, I love this. I think most people don't get there. But technically- okay. If you want to really get get to it, like you could say, okay, so there are yogis in the Himalayas who have been meditating in caves for 40 years. What good uh -huh. are they doing in the world? Who knows? Okay. Now, this is where my work comes in. Existing. Existence. You are my existence. And I don't do YouTube because I think it's my obligation to society to help people. No. I think it's my obligation to myself to live within my values and to have a job that coincides with my values. And I am interested in problem solving and I like it when I help people. That's like a plus. So if I can help you guys like feel good about your journey and where you're going and like, you know, I got a comment the other day and I love when I get these kinds of comments, which is like, oh, nobody in my life talks like this. Nobody in my life is willing to have these conversations. Oh, I love those comments. Those comments are my favorite because it's like, yes, let's have that conversation. What is it? What do you want to know about? Free will? Determinism? What do you want to know about? Like, what do you want to do? What's the conversation you want to have? Like, I want to bring in all the young people, the newbies that are like, hey, what if Catholicism isn't the answer? I'm like, let's go. What if like this thing isn't the answer? Let's go. I want to, I want to bring people along. But I don't think I'm doing it because I'm like, oh, I'm like, this is my obligation to society. No. This is my obligation to my consciousness and my joy. I'm obligated to my joy and my joy is searching and being curious and, and satisfying that curiosity and I like to problem solve. And so basically I turned my joy into a job. All the years I've been on YouTube, I've always struggled to like figure out how to like make this a job and I only did it in the last few years because I figured out how to make my joy into a job. To be fair, I only just discovered my joy like four years ago. So... You know what I mean? Have you ever talked to Dr. K? No, but I'd be open to it, especially to talk about this kind of stuff. Oh my God. I should reach out to him and be like, bro, I love this kind of stuff, right? But again, I discovered this 
on my own journey and doing my own thing. But I love that he's talking about something that I have a lived experience with that he's just talking. He's never met me and I've never met him. But yes, like this, he knows a part of my lived experience because we're all having, some of us are having this lived experience all over the planet. And it's amazing. And it's amazing. It's just like the most amazing, amazing, amazing thing, you know? It's just, oh, I love it. So, okay. Um, okay, existing versus existence. So again, you have to ask yourself, what is my obligation to myself? And what is my obligation to existence? I have an obligation to existence through my values, Brittany, constructed values that I will harm reduce. So I live in a place called Croatia and I'm married to a person um, who lives here and I have to act according to the values of this country because like I'm a guest in their home and this is where I live. And if I'm in America, even though I was born there and I'm not a guest there, I'm technically sort of a guest in the society that I was born into, even though it is my society because it wasn't constructed for me and I just live there. It always feels like I'm a guest. That's one of the reasons that I often don't worry about my own uh, needs with strangers or friends as much as, I, I mean, I do worry about my needs, but you know what I mean? I only show a part of myself is because I always feel like a guest everywhere. Like, I always feel like a guest everywhere, right? Because no one really has my shared values or beliefs. So until I met my partner. My partner is the only person that when I'm with him, I don't feel like I have to hide any part of me. But with my friends and family who can't see every part of me, it just feels really unfair to them to just be like, but I want to do it this way. So you have to do it my way. It's like, no, I don't want to do that to people, right? I'm a very considerate person. So I think because I have my joy and I know who I am and I'm not worried about it, I can just like have fun with people and jump into their world and be like, what are we doing today in this world? And then jump back into my bubble and be like, okay, whoo, I'm just going to breathe. You know what I'm saying? So what is your obligation to existing versus existence? So my obligation is to harm reduce and be kind to people and understand yourself and not worry about making people like me. My job is not to make the world like Brittany. My job is to learn how to be Brittany within the world. That is my job. Whoop. It says OBS disconnecting. Are we still here? Reconnecting. Hold on. Reconnection. Successful. I don't even know if I went away. It happened so fast. I'm still here. Yes. I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> Somebody tell me I am here. Am I here? Am I here? When I go to my mom's house, instant alien mode, I'm just saying. We're all do it. We all do it for all people in different ways. We do it for society. We do it when having a conversation. So that's what I'm saying. When you zoom out, okay, you never left. Great. When you zoom out and you look at the world and you notice like you're a little speck of energy on this planet, it's very hard to, to want to cause violence and to want to cause harm. But then when you zoom into our micro like lives, then it's like, let's fight. We're YouTube enemies now. Like that's what I mean. Like I have no enemies. I have only different people. And we're all like in conflict, but that's normal and natural. Conflict between humans is normal and natural. So I have no enemies. I have only people that I'm in chaos with, which is fine because that's life, baby. You know what I mean? So again, you have to ask yourself, do you have an obligation to society? And I think the answer is only if you want to. But decide what that obligation is. My obligation is to myself, my happiness, my family, and my friends, then to the society I live in or in conjunction with, right? If you talk to a Catholic like my parents, they'd say, God, my husband, my wife, my kids. And I would say, me, my husband, okay, or me, my husband, depending on how you look at it, okay, my work, my family, okay, and then my society, you could say my obligation to me and my husband is sort of is my obligation to my job though, right? And then my family definitely comes second or third to those things and then society. But some people are like society first, then my job, then my kids. Okay. That's my answer. Oof, such a good philosophy answer. And I feel like Steven's not getting it. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, what was this originally about what it means to dissolve your desires? Could be the ADHD, could be the anti philosophy or the spiritual part of his brain. But Dr. K just, oh, these are the answers I will give people. And they're just like, Brittany didn't say anything. And I'm like, he's saying everything. 
Like he's saying every, he's giving you the answer. He's literally like, this is it. This is the answer. And they're like, where is it? And I'm like, it's right here. Can't you see it? It's right here. This is the answer. And they're like, where is it? I'm like, oh. Okay. Yeah, it, is uh, that it was good. good. Okay. Right. So, so gotcha. I, I, th I think it will lead to less suffering. But the interesting uh -huh. thing, the reason people get scared about it is because as we dissolve our desires, we also lose uh -huh. some things that give us a compass in life, like ambition. Yes. 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 Which is the journey Abba's on right now. Ooh. I'm so excited for Abba. Abba's on that journey where he's like, I'm not that ambitious. And I'm like, I know, isn't it exciting? Oh, it's so exciting. You go through this journey in life where you lack so much ambition. You're a lazy piece of shit. And you're not doing anything for yourself or your community. That's not good. Then you go on the journey where you're so ambitious, you lose every side of your family and friends. That's not good. Then you find the balance between doing right by your family and friends and you and your society and not being ambitious. And that's the sweet spot. I love it. Everyone's ambitious in their own ways, right? But there is like, oh, it's like, oh, yeah, this stuff is low key. Felt like it was wishing destiny. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love, sorry, I just slapped the mic. I love it. It's like, oh, there's like this whole thing where, yes, when I became, like, when I went on this journey, and I'm still on the, obviously, the journey of like wisdom and all that stuff, I'll never be wise. But as I'm on this journey, I do, like, it's hard to care about money and it's hard to care about these things, but you have to do it because you got to pay your bills and you got to eat. And then it's hard to, like, so you work really hard within the mechanism that makes sense for you. That's what I want to give you guys. I want to give you a tool to get a job that doesn't make you want to die, that make, choose a life that doesn't make you want to die. Like, I want you to choose partners that don't make you want to die. Like, I want you to choose a life that doesn't make you want to die. You know what I mean? Because I went my whole life wanting to die because existence was so exhausting. And then I was like, what the fuck is this? And now I found it. I found my little place on the earth and a little game of money that I don't mind and like a little way of living that doesn't kill me. And it's wonderful. It's the best thing ever. And this is my little joy. I'm like fulfilling my curiosity and I've got like this whole little thing and everything's like, This is all I want to give you. This is like the little tool. But in order to get it, you have to want it and need it. Specifically, you got to need it. Dr. K is giving the answer. So when you come to me and say, what do I do now? How do I live my life? Find something you're curious about it and dive into it. You say you want to live your life, but you're spiraling on how to live your life. Live your life. But how do I do that? How do I live my life? Find something that makes you excited that isn't about status or the bubble, something that is truly curious, you know, something that is curious, you know, something that is interesting, something that is joyful, something that is peaceful, something that makes you feel like ding, 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 like excited, but not excited. Like, yeah, learning good, like learning, like learn, like live your life and like but, you know, you got to do it in a way that makes sense. School, I'm horrible at school. I cried all through school. I will cry if I have to go back to school. I can't do school. But you know what? I can read a thousand more books. I can watch a thousand more lectures. I can, you know what I mean? I can go meditate in the woods. You know what I mean? All of that stuff. Like there's some, there's some, he's literally giving the answers. But if you can't, if you don't need them and you can't hear them, everything he says is just going to sound silly. Because you're looking at him like, What? But everything he's saying makes like, mm, so much. Oh, yes, yes. Sure. I think I probably w would agree with that. That like people people reframe a lot of things negatively that are probably actually important parts of society. So for instance, like um, feeling negative when your peers judge you or feeling competitive or a pressure to do something socially is probably an important part of the human experience in terms of like building societies because we want to feel like we can pressure people to act in certain ways, stuff like that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think one mm -hmm. of the biggest mistakes we make in our society is that assuming that negative emotions are bad. Like there's a reason why every that, human yeah. being feels anger, feels shame, fears guilt, feels guilt. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's fascinating because as people move away from their negative emotions, that's actually when they get stuck. Because if, if you kind of think about it, like um, I, I, I did a YouTube video about this, but it's a fascinating concept that like everyone avoids shame, but shame is the most powerful, corrective, motivating force in you as a human mm -hmm. being. And so when you start suppressing shame, you, li mm -hmm. you literally neuroscientifically. Oh, 
kitty. This is such a, oh, this is what people mean when they say they feel seen by you. I feel so seen right now. <laughs> Yay. I feel seen right now. Dr. K makes me feel seen and then I can make you guys feel seen. But when he talks, I'm like, yes, this is like, mm, this is the stuff that makes me so, so, so joyful. Like, I just like, yes, like, oh, mm, this is like what I've been working on. And this is like what I think is so interesting. And this is what I want to convey to people, especially like, oh, I just, yes, yes, yes. Lose out on the ability to learn from mistakes and adapt to circumstances. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. There's a quote that I had when I was a StarCraft two player 13 years ago, but the quote was like, to achieve perfection is to sacrifice growth. And the idea is that like, if you don't feel an impetus to change or to improve or do something, then you've essentially like cut yourself off from any yeah motivating forces to actually change or be better. So yeah, I think I would agree with that. So the interesting thing is that as you dissolve more desires, you become more free and you can end up choosing to act compassionately, which is usually what happens. That's good. So compassion meaning to suffer with, right? So it's very specific. Compassion means to suffer with. You're seeing someone, you're recognizing like I am you and you are me and I'm suffering with you. I'm really feeling your pain, which often leads you to helping and being more wonderful and being a good community member. So even when you go on the journey of introspection and you're doing a solo journey, you do end up becoming a good community member. That's why I think like fives are less violent than twos in general. But fives can fall into two bubbles. Again, we do it often. In my, in your thinking, you're afraid, especially when you're afraid. When you're afraid, you start thinking like a two again. You start going, oh my God, they're the enemy. I have to hurt the enemy. The enemy. There is no enemy. There are only people in chaos with you. There are no enemies. There are only people in conflict with you. No one is your enemy. They are simply a bear doing what a bear does. And you are simply a bear doing what a bear does. We are, we are all just on a journey doing what Andrew Tate had to be Andrew Tate and Sneeko had to be Sneeko and Steven had to be Steven and Dr. K has to be Dr. K and I have to be Brittany. And as much as we are meant to be who we're meant to be, determinism, we also have this access to free will that I think has to be enacted and engaged, evoked. And then you unlock that little bubble and all of a sudden you're making different decisions than what was set out for you. But also the things that are set out for you are also okay to go with sometimes. Because sometimes like, Sometimes you, you know, sometimes it's just a part of going with the wave of life, you know? So I, I think getting rid of ambition is only scary until you discover that there are other compasses. And most people want the compass instead of ambition because yeah. ambition is like relentless and it kind of drives okay. you as opposed to you controlling it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and the freedom. Like... Yeah. No, God. The freedom to choose is uh, liberating. And oftentimes when people are truly free to choose, they make the right choices. Okay. My <laughs> bro. <laughs> second monitor is here, so I'm looking at you, but it looks like I'm not looking at you. But just so you know the okay. you're right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um Kay says, yeah, my heart blew open when I went down this path. My compassion is higher than it's ever been and it keeps getting higher. Same. I have no enemies. Same. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so in, insane to think about it. Like you, like when I see people in conflict and people are really hurting each other, I'm just like, stop. And I fall into it. Like, that's the thing is like, when I go back on, when I'm not engaging in my free will, I go back into being upset with people in a way that I know is so, so not in tune with what I, I know better, but when I'm not engaging with my free will, I do ha harbor more like, like frustration. And then when I enact my free will, when I'm back in my free will, I'm like, okay, we're good. People are great. Everyone's lovely. Humans are the worst, but also it's beautiful. Just like a bear attacks a human and eats it. It's a part of nature. And this is a part of nature. But it's very hard to live in that place all the time. It is. It takes a lot of meditative practice to be in awareness that everything is a part of life. Everything is exactly the way it should be. <sighs> you can do things differently, but you also can't in, until you can. Like you cannot do it differently until you can do it differently. And until you can do it differently, it's just what it is. 
That's why you can't live for people's potential. That's why you can't get frustrated when people don't act the way you're like, why aren't you doing this? Why do you keep hurting people? They're doing exactly the thing they can do in the moment. And until they can do something different, this is the only thing they can understand. And so it's about like, that's why you forgive. Forgiveness is about you. You are forgiving your, your desire to hate them. You're saying, I forgive you so I don't hate you. I forgive you so I don't hate myself. You know, you're saying, okay, I'm very frustrated, but I'm going to let this go. Some people call, you know, in religious bubbles, they'll go, I'll give it to God. Right? Some people, they give it to the universe. Me, I just let it go. Back into the back into the world. I let this energy that I have back into the universe. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes I have to vent it out. Sometimes I have to yell about it. Sometimes I get on stream and I'm frustrated. But then when I'm in a really good place, like today especially, I'm like in a much better place today. Like in terms of like my balance. And so I'm like, okay, we're good. Like everything is great. Everyone is where they're supposed to be. Everyone's doing what they should be doing. It is what it is. I am frustrated with it sometimes. But also that frustration is a part of the natural cycle. And I'm allowed to be frustrated because I'm a human. And I don't want to deny myself the reality that I'm frustrated. But I also want to take that frustration, put it in a little jar and send it on its way, you know? Okay. Did you want to walk down this road anymore? Do you want to move to another area or? Well, I, did I answer your question? Um, something that would, this is very difficult for me. Um, I think something that would help push me along a little bit, it's very hard for me to find role models since my job and everything I do is like so unique. It's really hard to find people in the world that I would go like, oh, this guy's doing something. I want to be more like him. Um, I think that when you give me this kind of overarching like uh, dissolution of desires, the freedom to choose better paths, oftentimes the path that you choose post-dissolution will be better than the, you know, the more hardline road you run prior to that. It would be interesting if there were people that I could look at that were achieving or accomplishing in my arena, those types of things that had made those decisions. Does that make sense? Who is he talking about? So I find this to be a struggle because in my brain, like I could easily just like look at any philosopher. I could look at Dr. K. I could look at anyone who's older and more calm than I am. <laughs> like I just, it'd be so easy for me because like I'm in the philosophy, spiritual like bubbles. So it's easy for me to be like, oh yeah, them. And oh, this person and this. So I have like hundreds of examples of like role models or when I was younger, I had so many mentors. So it's very easy for me. Like I could just look at Dr. K and be like, oh, yeah. Cool. Like easy. Like, oh, K says I hate the word role model. I just use the word inspiration. Yeah, that's what I mean by role model. I have no role models, but I get inspired by all sorts of people every day. Yeah, so same. Wait. Oh, OK, wait. There's the bubble where role model means like pedestal and I don't mean that I mean I look at people every day just like at the supermarket or in my life and I'm like oh I'm so inspired by this thing you're doing I'm gonna learn from this so yes okay yes I think role models aren't people we put on pedestals they're people we learn from so I could learn from a child who's doing something interesting I'm like fun I'm gonna take this wisdom that a child just gave me right or oh this like old lady here just gave me like patience with this thing or like Oh, this like, so yes. Okay. Lots of bubbles. Discord says they use role model as idol. Don't do that. Er, scratch that bubble language. You're right. I think a lot of bubbles do do that. Don't do that. Role models, mentors, don't put them on a pedestal. That That's where that saying, don't meet your heroes come from. Don't do that. All humans are flawed. All humans are imperfect. Nobody is perfect. Even the greatest, most nicest, most wonderful person you've ever met probably has a life you would learn about and it would shock you down to your core right? So you do not want somebody who's perfect. You want somebody who has a, a, a piece of wisdom to give you or some sort of insight to give you. Hayda says, it's an interesting problem to have. My role models, inspiration, are all spiritual philosophical. Um, so uh, if you don't have that, who do you have? It's, in you know, yeah, yeah, this is this is a difficult, this is a difficult word to use. So like, I would definitely reframe that relationship we're having with the word. Is he wanting a role model that fully encompasses the type of person he wants to be? That's the dilemma. I do think like I've heard Steven say this before and it's always confused me. 
And I do think he's probably falling into the common trap I see in the hustle bubble culture. Like, uh, Grant Cardone is my my mentor, my 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 role model. And it's like, why? And it's like, because he makes lots of money. And I'm like, why? Andrew Tate's my role model. Why? Because he makes lots of money. And it's like, okay, I want like, when I say role models, I mean inspiration from. Right? Inspiration from. Rosie says, I really lost him when he said this. Like, what does that, what does he mean? You can collect that information you need from everyone and everything. That's the problem though. It's like, there is a bubble that pedestals role models and Destiny or Steven's probably in that bubble where, again, it's, I see it in hustle bubbles a lot where people become like worshipy and like, um, like almost cult-like with their role models. Don't do this. Just learn from people, take them off that pedestal. Just say like, oh, you know, this is what I can learn from you, right? Oh, cool. This is what I can learn from you. There's so much inspiration to be had all over the world in different bubbles, right? Heather says, Stephen won't find anyone exactly like him to look up to. Maybe that's why he's lost and confused. Well, also, I think it's also that double-edged sword of like, well, I can't find anyone, so I must be me. I must be the role model. Or, ooh, I can't find anyone, so I guess I'm so special. If you make it impossible to find that person, you're never going to find them. And the mistake, that's, again, that's going back to that saying of don't meet your don't meet your heroes. It's because you put them on a pedestal, and when you find out they're not perfect, you lose faith in humanity, when the humanity should have been the faith you had in yourself. And then that faith you have in yourself, you can learn to have in other people. And you know yourself. You know you're flawed. You know you fucked up. You know you're not perfect. You know you've hurt people. You can start allowing people that room to do the same in their life, right? So again, I have no enemies. I have only conflict with humans. And the conflict I have with the humans is the conflict I have with myself. Why can't this person do this thing that I would love for them to do? Well, Brittany, why can't you do this thing by letting it go to let them do their thing? Good point, me. <laughs> right? You know, do we not like Destiny? I've always liked his TikToks. No, we like Steven well enough. His TikToks are not a representation of his work. Oh, my God. If you only know Steven's work through TikTok, you do not know Steven. Okay? Like, you need to watch his streams. You need to consume his content. You can watch his collaborations with me. But if you've only watched Steven's TikToks, like... <laughs> Oh my God, I don't even know how, I don't even know what his TikToks are like. Like I see them sometimes, but like, no, like that to get the understand, it's just like, it's just like Leo Skeppy. You cannot watch his TikToks. Okay. But we like Steven. We're rooting for Steven. We want Steven to, 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 to we, yeah, Destiny Factorio streams are the best. <laughs> <coughs> We love Steven. We want the best for him. But also specifically, we're watching this video because we're here about what Dr. K is saying. What Dr. K is saying is really what we're listening for because he's spitting facts right now. He's spitting facts, you know? <clears throat> so for instance, something you're telling me um, is the, uh, the, the ambition driver, the ambition engine might feel good because it pushes and pushes and pushes, but that if you could dissolve everything underneath that and then make other choices, it might be better. But I mean, obviously, intellectually and emotionally, I'm very tied to that ambition engine. And it's hard for me to, I'm hearing what you're saying, but there's a lot of- Okay, wait, I said this about Sneeko. I said when Sneeko and I were talking, and <clears throat> we don't talk anymore, he hasn't reached out. But when I talked to Sneeko back in the day, um, my advice to him was like to be poor was to like lose this, this desire to be Andrew Tate. And he would have been poor if he took my advice because I would have told him this ambition is going to ruin your life. But it's not ruining his wallet, right? So the issue is that if you are ambitious and you want to make money and you want to be a top G, then listening to Dr. K or Brittany sounds like the worst thing in the world because it's like, so you want me to be poor? And it's the same thing that even Jesus Christ preached or the Buddha preached, which is like you have to let go of these worldly things in order to seek true joy and happiness, which is almost like separating yourself from like, but at the same time, we live in a world and it's good to be ambitious and it's good to get your bag and money is not the root of all evil. It's just what you do with it. But the idea is that if you don't have a balance, you're going to get sucked into the wrong direction, and only one direction. So again, it's not that money is evil, right? It's not like ambition is evil. It's the level to which you engage with these things that can be detrimental to your growth. It won't necessarily ruin your life. You could probably live a pretty stable life for the rest of your life. Andrew Tate's probably going to live pretty fine for the rest of his life. But is he going to be spiritually or metaphysically or conscientiously fulfilled? 
Is he going to actually find his joy or is he always going to be in conflict with this faux happiness of through like materialism and status? And that's the question, right? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Discord. DGG about to clip Brittany and say she compared herself to Jesus and the Buddha. I mean, they were both just men. And am I not a man? Am I not just a man like they were? We are all just men. So honestly, am I not the same as these two ladies? Let's be real. So anyways, okay. All, all people are saying, all anyone is ever saying when they're on this particular journey is that you can get lost in the ambition. Even ABBA just put out that video, which was so good about not being very ambitious. Because there comes a point in your career when you can just coast and chill. And that used to be the goal for so many people, but some people get lost in the sauce. Like I think Sneeko did, right? Sneeko has so much potentiality for introspection, so much potentiality for real joy, but he's too lost in the ambition. And it's so clear, right? Discord says, what I hear Destiny saying is, quote, I work so hard to get here. Tell me that I'm getting, tell me that getting rid of this thing that got me here, it'd be worth it. Yeah. Well, that's the dilemma. It's only worth it if it fulfills your joy and it's within your need. And it's, it's, you have to be willing to risk it all. You have to be like, literally, I think to go on this journey of introspection, you have to be willing to lose every single dollar you've made, everything you've built for yourself, every relationship you've built for yourself. Just like Aang and the guru, Aang had to let go of Katara to reach the avatar state. And I always think it's worth it if it's a part of your need, but it might not be the journey for everybody, which is why I don't make the prescription that everybody should go on this journey. I think you should only go on this journey if you start asking yourself, why aren't I fulfilled? Probably because you're meant to go on this other journey. And now technically Stephen is reaching out to Dr. K and he might be asking for this reason or he might not be, right? But just like Aang had to let go of Katara to become the Avatar in order to defeat the Fire Lord by not killing him, please note, he had to let go of Katara. Now Aang marries Katara. So how does Aang let go of Katara and still end up with Katara? Which is the question Steven's asking. How do I let go of my ambition without letting go of everything I've built? We're not saying to throw it all in the trash. We're saying to let go of the attachment you have to it to allow yourself an opportunity to actually know how you feel about it and your relationship to it. You're letting go of the attachment. If you love it, let it go. And you're seeing if it comes back to you. Karma is not, okay, you do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. Karma is the reflection of your life back to you. It's the mirror. Karma is my life reflected back to me. It's what I've put into my life, right? belief without me being able to find somebody in the world and go like oh that person did that and i see they're doing like i aspire to that i want to aspire to that so it would push me in that direction does that make sense what i'm saying yeah well but uh so so do you i'm mm -hmm. i'm getting kind of this tacit idea that i need someone to not need but mm -hmm. if i set a role model for myself it helps motivate my behavior i could or like um if there's a particular habit that's good, I like to see the proof of concept of that, I guess. So like if somebody tells me something like, oh, like um, you met me a year ago and I told you that I was going to read, you know, one book a week. And he can't, though. He can't. He doesn't want to believe it because when he looks at my work and he goes, Brittany doesn't platonically cuddle with her friends. No shot. He's not. He doesn't actually want to say proof of concept. Because he's not saying, oh, that's interesting, Brittany. How did you do that? I'm so curious. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't actually want to say proof of concept. He wants to pretend he does. So he uses the words, which we all use. It's like when you're talking to a conservative who's trying to like convert a gay or a trans out of their lifestyle, you know, like, <laughs> are you okay? And they're like, oh, yeah. I'm totally, oh, of course, I'm totally open. If you can prove me wrong, I'll tell you, I'll be pro-gay today, I promise. They just want you to like feel safe enough to talk to them so they can try to convert you. But Destiny listens to mostly prove wrong because he's in debate bro mode. This is my theory. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying this is what I've observed. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. I'm a YouTuber and this is all I do for a living is observe people, thank you. So again, See how Stephen is like, I want the proof of concept. It's there. It's written in books, people's testimonials. When people tell me they've done something, 
My job is to say, cool, can you show me? Because I'm curious and I want to feed my curiosity. And then if I feel like they've done it, cool. And if they haven't, I'm like, well, what about this? And then all you have to do is ask someone why. Why, 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 why make them break it down until they realize they haven't discovered it. I can't tell you how many people I've had call me or talk to me. And the moment they think, Brittany, I actually think this. And I'm like, oh yeah, why? Oh, fuck. And I'm like, "Mm mm-hmm, can't answer it. Come back when you can answer it, right? There's something in the way you speak that tells me how open you are and how ready you are for the conversation. When I read about cannibals eating, like eating uh, urine and sleeping in graveyards and doing all these things, the first thought I had was like, oh, wait, if you can do that, what else can we do? Wait, is this real? People will hear that story and think, ew, gross, absolutely not. As we quote the great destiny herself, no shot, no shot. But Brittany at 19 years old, and I'm 34 at 19, I went, wait, is this a thing? Can people do this? My friend was doing um, the Peace Corps and went to a place in Africa where they dug up people's bodies and danced with them to celebrate. And she got hit right in the face with a corpse. And my brain went, wait, this is a thing? Bubble pop. I got excited. I didn't sit there and doubt it. I didn't say, I need to see the proof of concept. The proof of concept is in the story. The proof of concept is a whole culture that's built around this belief. That's the proof of concept. The fact that someone has a lived experience and then we can talk about it. Does it work for this individual only or can it work for a whole culture? Who can it work for? When I see age gap relationships work, my bias against them has to go, eh. So my job is to say, okay, Brittany, generally speaking, you might be right, but let's look at these unique anomalies that happen where age gap relationships are actually really what's good for this consciousness and this consciousness. So of course it can work, right? And to what extent are we defining the word work? And then we have to ask ourselves, why are we defining this word work? To which level are we holding it like uh, up against? So for me, when I say work, I mean to the best, healthiest degree, which most age gap relationships won't qualify for. But they will qualify for mid row, even top row, and then sometimes maybe even the most degree. I just haven't met them yet. So like I'm still looking because I'm curious. Can I find an age gap relationship that is healthy to the largest degree? I haven't found it yet, but I'm looking. Again, I'm curious because in a planet of 8 billion people, there must be somebody. Who is this somebody? What is their lived life like? Right? How exciting. So again, as much as I love Steven and I really do love this consciousness, like I really am rooting for him, this is the reason why he's not ready, right? Because he's still asking the questions that actually are putting up a wall that are actually denying him access to actually hearing Dr. K, which is fair, or even trusting that my lived experience is real, fair. But you have to be open and curious to actually solve these questions. And then they talked to me about, you know, the 52 different books they read last year, just because they found some like novel way to work reading into their schedule. Um, Like maybe they read like two pages after every League of Legends game. If I see that, then in my life, I'd be like, holy crap, this guy has a really good outcome. He had a really cool process for doing it. I'm going to copy that. That's such a good, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, so when you're talking about the dissolution thing, I'd be curious. Yeah. I don't, I don't know who you would consider a good role model. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that, so all like, the only thing that comes to my mind is my own experience with my own journey, but I don't think that I am an appropriate role model for you. I think we're colleagues and I'm happy to share what that experience looked like for me. And the reason that I'm advocating for it is because I think it has been profoundly positive in my life. Oh, and this is something else. It has been profoundly, it has been profound in my life. That's why I like Dr. K, right? We have overlap, but- When people ask me, do you think the whole world should be fives? No. Do I think the whole world should go on the journey of the Buddha? No. No. The world should do whatever it takes to find their joy as individuals and consciousness. So maybe Stephen doesn't need to go on this journey. He might not need to, right? So Dr. K is giving him a lived experience that's saying this was my journey, but it might not be yours. It just might not. Okay. Um, I can you actually, so then I'm kind of curious for however much you're obviously comfortable sharing. Um, you have, from everything that I've seen, you've got an awesome family, you've got an awesome like company and you do really cool stuff online. How do you balance out, um, 
Yeah, how do you balance it? What's the emotional decision? Somebody comes to you with a with an offer uh, or an ability to expand your business, you know, twofold. You've got an opportunity to do this, but it might come at like significant cost to your family. What is your what does the process look like for you? How Good do you even begin to have that internal dialogue? Yeah, yeah so yeah. I, I I can share my own experience. Um, so mm -hmm. to begin with, like I wanted to be big when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted mm -hmm. to be an important person. I grew up Indian. Um, an Indian diaspora in the United States means that you've got a couple of career choices. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a there's a very strong founder effect. So there's like serious brain drain. Sorry, this is a great story. So we are going to listen to it. I want to get to the comments really fast. Dr. K responded wonderfully. True. Um, I do get where he's coming from. Absolutely. I mean, where Stephen is coming from is where most people I think are coming from. They found success in their own world. They're afraid to lose everything they've built, but they also find themselves curious about something else. But is it curious enough to actually engage? And are they willing to lose everything to find the answer? And that's what's so scary is like, how do I know I'm being curious and thoughtful and willing to lose everything, but I'm also not going to lose everything? But maybe I would. But maybe, you know what I mean? Because you actually have to be open to it. Right. It's like that King and Peel skit again where they're praying around the table and they're like, Jesus Christ, we love you, God. And then God's like, leave all your possessions and follow me. And they're like, everything, though, they want you want us to be like poor. And they're like and they pretend it's like a ghost in the house, because when it actually comes to it, people aren't willing to do what it takes. They just want to pretend they do or they want to live in a nice, safe area of like, oh, this is me like half pretending. Right. Which I love. Love that for everybody. But that's what people are doing. And so the question is, is like. Steven has to ask himself, am I comfortable where I am or am I actually uncomfortable enough to do something about it? And most people can stay uncomfortable for their whole lives. I can't, and I don't think Dr. K can, and I don't think a lot of you can, but f I've seen it happen. So many people around me live perfectly comfortable, uncomfy for most of their lives. And I think that's fine. I would rather get those people even, even if they don't have to go on this particular journey, I'd love to get them to like a two joy. You know what I mean? Just like a two joy. Even if they don't get to a five joy and then whatever else is beyond that, which is a whole other game. You know what I mean? And as you guys know, like people are always telling me like, Brittany, there's more than level five. Cool. Love that. You do that. Right now I'm focusing right here. I'm just trying to get people. I'm right here. My journey is still right here. Okay. So like, love that. Go be the Buddha and meditate in the woods. I'm still right here. I'm doing this thing right here. So love that. I'm not doing that game. We're doing this game. But everyone else has their own game. You know what I mean? You know? Oh, it's so exciting. So all the uh -huh. Indian kids. So I grew up in a city where there were five people my age in the whole city. There were five Indian people in my grade uh -huh. in the whole city. Three of us became doctors. Right. So that's like it's just staggering. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I grew up with this culture that was very like education focused, achievement focused. Not tiger parents, but that's just kind of the culture. Like, my parents were very loving and supportive. Um, uh -huh. And so I grew up in, like, you know, when I was 15 or 16, I told people I wanted to be a doctor, and they got impressed with that because, mm. oh, I, Alok is such a smart boy, right? <laughs> and then oh that fed my ego. And of then course. when I went to UT, um, I was a freshman, and I majored in pre-med, and I was like, I'm going to be at the top of my class. And where did I want to go to med school? I wanted to go to med school at Harvard because that's where right. all the Indian kids want to go. Right. And so when that ambition was my primary driving force, I found that it could not conquer the other parts of myself because there was a part of me that wanted to play for 16 hours a day. And so those two parts would fight. And because uh -huh. of whatever, on some days I would study and on some days I wouldn't. And certainly not good enough to get into any medical school for that matter. So that changed when I went to India and I sort of discovered a different way of like looking at myself and like understanding like where my ambition comes from. And you and, real quick, how old were you when you went to India? 21. 21. Okay, cool. Okay, go ahead. And then, so I, I then decided to become a monk and then, but that too was like actually the same driving forces. What I later discovered is that I had concluded logically that like I can't compete with these kids like there's no way I'm going to be able to achieve my goals and what I want and I'm basically a failure at life so what I did okay hold on I saw a comment on Dr. K's video and it says destiny getting into meditation arc look 
I, so here's my personal belief. My personal belief is like not everyone's meant to go on the same journey. So this journey might be so counterintuitive to like destiny's joy. So we don't actually want to move Steven into this bubble just because it works for us, right? Because it is still a bubble. It's still a construct. This, this, this conversation we're having is still a construct created by a lot of us who are having a lived experience and feeling connected to this idea of recognizing like this is what it means to be a consciousness, right? But that's still a bubble. So it might not be the right bubble for Steven, right? Which is probably why he's not vibing with it. You know what I mean? But his job right now is to be curious enough to find the right vibe, right? So he's still just like looking for a bubble. Which bubble is my bubble? Where am I going to vibe? What am I looking for? What's the next thing? How do I find balance? So I do not want to say like, oh, Steven has to go on this like same journey, right? No. He has to find his joy and his joy might not look like this, right? This is still our bubble, like our hap, like we're so excited because we're excited in the same way everyone else is like, ooh, like don't we sound like a bunch of Catholics? Like, ooh, they, did he find the Catholic church? It's like, we don't want to, because uh, this is just like a, a, like a thing that worked for us, but it might not work for him. And I'm saying us, but like not everybody in my audience, right? Just like whoever it's relating to. And so again, we don't want to assume it's for him. Now, the only part of this that I think objectively is good for everybody is tackling past traumas, which we'll get into in the video and making sure that we're separating our mental health from our physical health, from our trauma, from our mental disorders, from our neurodivergency. That's like the realistic part everyone should be doing that I think most people miss as well. But that meditative part of it, that's like specific. Now, lots of people find meditation in different ways. Boxers, people who do sports, prayer, religion, yogis, like all of them are experiencing a version of meditation and prayer if you want to have a metaphysical, metaphysical sort of like relationship with it. Not everybody wants to have that though. As I did this really interesting ego trick where I started devaluing that which I could not have. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, oh, like all these kids are materialistic and they're shallow and they all want to, you know, make lots of money and drive fancy cars and things like that. I'm going to rise above that. Well, to be clear, Kay, you said, I think introspection can benefit everyone. That's probably my black and white belief. No, 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 no. Meditation is different than introspection. Going down the journey of like popping bubbles is a different than inner. Everyone needs introspection. I think everybody benefits from introspection. That's why ones are an anomaly because they refuse to introspect, though they're unironically almost like introspective in a way. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I think they're like fallen threes, but I'm not sure because on my on my introspective scale, I think everybody benefits from introspection, which is just the relationship you're having with your consciousness that does not have to involve meditation, does not actually have to involve much more than saying like, why do I like bananas? That's introspection. Asking yourself why you like something is introspection. And then how deep you ask yourself about why you like bananas is the levels of introspection, right? And become spiritual. So I'm gonna have this Super ego. common, yeah. Huh? I was gonna say that's super common, yeah. yeah that when it, somebody can't have something, they start to say, well, actually that sucks anyway, and this has been way better and blah, blah, blah. I forgot. Right. So, so mm -hmm. I, I kind of went down that road, and then thankfully my teachers recognized that my desire to become a monk was not like genuine, it was escapism. Yes. So uh -huh. they didn't take me. So the irony, and I love this, this happened to my brother. My brother was like, well, maybe I'm meant to be a priest since I can't find a wife. He went from monastery to monastery. You know, when you become a Catholic priest, they make you go through the ringer. You know, there's like a test. And my brother, every time they're like, no, you're not meant to be a priest. You're not meant to be a priest. And he's like, really? But I haven't found a wife and I haven't found a calling. And I just feel like maybe it's to be a priest or like, no, like you're not meant to be a priest. And it was a distraction. It was a cope. And then my brother found it later in his life, like his purpose and everything he's doing in life. But isn't that funny? Like Dr. K is making such a good point. Just because you go to India and you meditate doesn't mean you're having an introspective or a profound journey of introspection. You could just be coping, which is why, again, I'm very suspicious of cult-like behavior with like spiritual groups. Again, if you have to be a part of a group, if there's like a group involved, if it's like we're better than everyone else, like I'm like, eh. And see how Dr. K is like, I'm better. I'm a meditative guy and I'm not materialistic. And the monks are like, eh, no, you're missing the point. This is so important. So many people 
will send me videos and be like, is this a five? Is this a five? I'm like, they're sell. no, this is not a five. Like you're sell. they're selling you bullshit. And you're like, is this the height of, no, you know, the eat, eat, pray, love group. Hey, look, I love me some eat, pray, love, but man, that is a two fucking bubble if I ever saw one. Yes. It's like all these white women think they just go to India and they're going to be enlightened. And it's like, girl, sure, ma'am. Bryson says, is Destiny medicated during this conversation? By the way, I yes. Uh, in the beginning of the conversation, he said he's about two, I think, three weeks in, guys. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he did say that. What about Brittany Simon cult? Like, uh, what about Brittany Simon cult behavior? Shh, Reddit. The sex cult only exists on the Reddit. And it's even apparently like, we don't know. It's just like, shh, we don't talk about that. Me, but they continued teaching me. And then, you know, the big irony is at one, at some point I gave up on my dreams, right? I was like, there's no fucking way. I graduated with a 2.5 GPA, applied to med school for two years, got 110 rejections. No, sorry, 80 something rejections. Amazing. Applied my third year, got another 20, 30, 40. Yes, they end up in the wild, wild country type co compounds. Oh, that documentary is insane. 40 rejections. And at that point, like in that after my second year, I had kind of this formative moment where I started thinking about, okay, like, what do I want? And then I changed the way that uh -huh. I started looking. It's not about desire or anything like that. Like, I kind of let go of all that stuff. And I was like, my teachers told me to do something, so I'm going to do it out of, like, faith. Not yeah. out of personal desire or ambition or anything like that. I trust yeah. these people, and they said do this, so I'm going to do this. And even when everyone else... Can I ask told a question about yeah. that? Yeah. So... Hold on. Before we listen to the question, do you think Eckhart Tolle is a five? I get asked this question a lot. I don't feel confident answering that question. I've seen some of his lectures, but I would like to read his books and I would like to read it, see more of his. I try if I'm going to like try to genuinely guess a five versus a two pretending to be a five. I want to like consume at least like 10 hours of their content. So I haven't done my deep dive on Eckhart, but I'll do that. I'll read his books and I'll watch his lectures and I'll try to figure it out. My from what I've seen of him. He says a lot of good things, but I also get a lot of bad vibes. So I don't know because I can't tell if my bad vibe is the way his audience treats him. I get really uncomfortable around the way audiences treat their, the people they like. And I get uncomfortable with the way that they allow the audience to treat them. And that's my problem. But he could very well be a five. I mean, he definitely has the tendency of it. I've definitely seen some of his lectures, like I said. But I don't feel comfortable answering that. But he could be. Like, again, because a five to me isn't somebody who's necessarily good by our values or my values or anyone's values. They could be a chronic cheater, for all I know. I don't know. But, like, I think a, a five is less likely to do harm, right, along the way. So I don't know. I just – I don't know if he's, like, genuine or whatever – could a five be an evil five? Well, what is evil? Right? But yes. What it, you're asking, can a, can a five be a human? Yes. Evil is a prescription created by a construct that we label somebody because we don't like how they're acting. So yes, a five could be evil. You coming from the US and you being really ambitious and then you kind of like changing your ambitions to different things. Why were you in a state where you would trust those teachers? Or what do you think made it that you were like, you know what, I'm going to put aside my ego a little bit and trust these guys instead of just like, you know what, screw these guys are dumb. I'm going to go question. back and follow my own stuff. Yeah. So I would say that if you are a GSL champion in StarCraft mm -hmm. and you queue up against someone who just installed the game, <laughs> this mm -hmm. is what my interactions with them were like. They just crushed. Okay. I mean, it wasn't competitive. But they just bodied yeah. me like every, every yeah. single time. They understood Great so example. much about me that I did not mm -hmm. understand. And they taught me all of that stuff about myself. Okay. Right. So, so they like, basically yeah. bought the, they'd earned their respect with their, oh, absolutely. With just the knowledge and the ability. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Gotcha, so gotcha. They, they like help. Great question. But see how Dr. K was having a personal experience with them. They bodied him. Steven doesn't, Steven doesn't feel like he's met anyone who's bodied him. And that's what he's looking for when I think he wants a, a role model, which I think he just needs somebody he genuinely feels like is making him think or change his life. You know what I mean? Uh, Jessica says, watching you said you don't use the internet as a journal. Earlier you said you used to, though. So how can you ask somebody to be professional when you're just coming into this new life? I'm not sure of that question. I'm not sure what you mean by that. 
I want to answer the question, but I'm not sure what you mean. That was a perfect analogy, Kay. Absolutely. That was so good. Like that was so good. Ugh, I loved it. I loved that answer. Mother Teresa, do you have a notion where she could be on the scale? I mean, I would say it too. She was Catholic and she died a Catholic and they want to make her a saint and she claimed it was objective. So, you know, DGG was saying Dr. K bodied him. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's the problem. It's like he's not reacting like that, but then maybe it's his medication. I'm not sure. He's not seemingly, he doesn't seem like he's connecting with the words, but maybe, um, maybe he is, you know what I mean? I'm not sure, you know? Yeah. Oh my God, I know Discord. Discord, I sent this Asmongold gif that says, and so we're basically a sex cult, but we don't call it that. And that's <laughs> that's my new favorite gif. Oh, it's so funny. Oh, it's so funny. Uh, do you think Eckhart, he's a five, but could be reflecting a lot of two energy? Very possible, right? I do that in a ton of my work. Was Charles Manson a five? I don't think so. Charles Manson was really interesting in a lot of ways. Actually, I've seen tons of documentaries on Charles Manson. I've watched tons of interviews of him. It's been years since I've done it, but I went down the deep end on Charles Manson at one point in my life. I do think Charles Manson is difficult. Um, I don't think he's a five and I don't think he's a four. I think he's either like a 2A or a 2B or even a 2C or even maybe like a 2C. Maybe he was just mentally ill. Like, I don't know, because remember, the levels are dictated by your mental illness as well. Like, your mental illness can't be the reason you're a one. So if you're the lowest on the introspection scale, it can't be because you're mentally ill. Like, it has to be because, like, you're not being introspective, which mentally ill people can be introspective. So that's not an excuse, right? Um, so I don't know, right? I don't know. Charles Manson, I think he was he was either mentally ill. And so probably just like a two or a three or something, but mostly probably a two. And he was just kind of wild. You know what I mean? But I don't think he was anywhere near a five at all. Like it wouldn't make any sense for the way that he preached ideas, the way that he had a relationship with the world, the way he hurt people. Not that fives wouldn't hurt people, but I, I do think, I truly think when you go on an introspective journey, the one I'm talking about, just like your the chances of you committing violence are very low. I mean, it's possible. This is anecdotal. It's possible because I think you get stuck in two bubbles again. Like fives, I think, have two moments because they're not evoking free will. They're just going off of fear. But I think if you live in the present and you practice like present meditation, the chances of you doing that are very low. And so I, I can't say that Charles Manson would ever be seen as a five to me. Gracie, hi, Brittany, when were you diagnosed with BPD? Were you medicated when you get the diagnosis? I was not medicated. Um, I got the diagnosis in, hold on. I literally, I can't remember if it was August of 2018 or, or August of 2017. Let me look at my video. Hold on. I have an old video that's private now. BPD. Show all videos with that in the title. Uh, what? What did I title this video? Diagnosis? Diag, diagnosis? Diagnosis? Oh my God, what did I title this video? Oh, well, it must have been in 2018 because, oh, 2017. I'm not... I'm not finding the video I wanted to find because I have a video where I literally talk about it. And I'm like, I got diagnosed today. And I remember because there was a camping trip I was supposed to go on, but I didn't go on it because I was having an episode borderline. Maybe I called it borderline in the, in the title. Really, Brittany? Hold on. I'm really trying to find this video. Aha! I found it. July 2nd of 2017. Oh, July, August. Oh, I always thought it was diagnosed in August. Oh, my bad. So I guess I was diagnosed, I guess, in July or June of 2017. There we go. We found it. Yay. Yay. Yeah, I talk, I made a video <laughs> where I talk about getting diagnosed. So yeah, I get, I, 2017, I was diagnosed. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I was, I was diagnosed in Seattle. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Helps me understand like how to live like these fundamentals because uh -huh. we don't teach that we don't teach people how their mind works and then the uh -huh. other cool thing is they never asked me to have faith or trust in them what they my teachers were good they also recognized that what i needed was questions not answers uh -huh. 
they also did a good job of answering whatever questions I had, which in many spiritual traditions is like not very good. So it didn't matter mm -hmm. how hard the question was that I asked. They like basically always had a good answer. Yeah, love that. Okay. Um, Great and, answer. and so based on that, I was like, okay, these people know what they're talking about. And I think there's a lot of legitimacy to this. I also in that process started to trust more into it because I started looking into the science. I was very skeptical of all this meditation stuff when I started. I didn't believe it. Uh -huh. I thought it was all BS. Yeah. And then I, okay. I got my first research position mm. uh, studying complementary alternative medicine. And that was a very formative experience for me, too. Yes. This the is science is showing the benefits, whether you want to believe it or not, bros. Science and meditation have a relationship. Val, great question. How can you see the difference between coping or your journey path? Do you try it? Do you just try until it feels right? You try until you sync up with your joy and then you try to sync up with your joy presently. So I would say that there's like multiple journeys people go on, right? So it depends. Like there's there's no real end goal. There's only getting to certain like levels and then you just always keep going, right? So I, I want to like encourage people to remember like there's no real end to the journey. There's only the end to your particular station. Like I'm right here and this is where I want to stay. And I know I'm not going to be the Buddha and go into a forest and meditate because I need to be right here right now. But I know there's another part of the journey I could go on, but I'm not engaging with it because I need to be right here. So even my five level isn't the height of introspection, right? Okay. So there's like other parts of it that you can go on, like living presently 20, like more than just five minutes at a time, like living presently, not, okay. There's the two world where they say live in the present. And that's like live in today. Okay. Then there's like the meditative practice of like live in the literal present of the millisecond. Live in it right now. Like live in it. Like breathe in and like notice every blade of grass like I'm living in the absolute present. That is very exhausting and I can't do it all the time. So that could be a whole journey I could go on for the rest of my life, right? Where I just practice doing that. But right now I'm busy living in the between that present and the two present of like live in the present, Brittany, today is Tuesday. Nope, today is Monday. And we're going to enjoy today's Monday. Okay, so there's two types of present. So when you ask yourself, am I coping or am I in the journey I'm supposed to be on? Yes and no and yes and no and yes and no. Right? It's okay to cope. It's okay to find your joy. It's okay to stop at a place in your journey. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to keep going. And so joy is kind of the fundamental tool I use. You could use a different one. For me, it's always joy. Hey, I'm at a sink right now. I'm not feeling that great right now. Hey, I've noticed that like, <clears throat> like today someone said like today I have like a sparkle in my eye. Today I'm really in tune with like today I'm really like, <sighs> I feel really great today. And um, that makes sense because the last few days have been really great. And there were moments of feeling out of sync with my body. And oh, have they covered this yet? They haven't, I don't think. <clears throat> Maybe they did earlier about body and mind and brain and body. Like, you know, you I'm always moving these things into sync, especially somebody with borderline or somebody with internal trauma or chronic pain. You're always having like a possibility of a, a switch flipping. You're always at the mercy of <clears throat> your body or your brain not being able to live in the present because it's stuck in the trauma, right? So there's like, today I feel much more in sync with everything. Today everything feels much more in sync. Um, yesterday I had a moment where like my body was out of sync and I'm like, dude, like what's going on? Like I've been working out what's happening. And a lot of it is just like you wake up every day and you wonder how the chronic pain is going to be. So how do you know if you're on the right journey? I think for me it coincides with my joy, right? <gasps> Thank you, Hada. I do feel like I'm glowing today. I'm pregnant with joy. <laughs> I'm not pregnant. This is okay. all a roundabout way of saying like, as I gave up on my ambitions and just focused on, let's call it being a better person or accomplishing whatever, like a different kind of internal compass, I actually floated to the top of like the competitive pool. Okay. And then my ambitions reemerged when I actually started uh, exactly. So I did medical school at Tufts same. and then I... Uh, same, same, same. I'm sorry. I've like struggled my whole life with like, what am I supposed to do? I remember when I quit YouTube to go meditate and I was just on Patreon and I like left the internet because I was like, this place is bad. I don't like it. People are mean. And I like left the internet and I went into the woods at my brother's farm and I like meditated and built fences at 6 a.m. in the morning. And I was like, who am I? What am I doing with my life? And I was still working on Patreon. So I was still making money, which was amazing. Thank you for supporting me during that era of Brittany. But what I was really doing was letting go of all of my ambitions and recontextualizing re my life and restarting. And then one day I woke up and I was like, oh, ding, 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 ding. 
and I came back to YouTube and I came back totally different and so much stronger. And now I'm where I'm at. Guys, like literally when I was recontextualizing my life and starting again, I quit everything and I went from, you know, 60K a year down to 15K a year. And then I sat there at 15K a year for about a year. And I was like, what am I doing, right? I went on this road trip and I lived off very little money. And then I went and lived with my brother and I lived off very little money. And then once I got back on it, like once I literally let go of everything, once I think I became what I call a five, right? When I when I hit that moment of like, oh my God, existing and existing existence, that's when I went on the trajectory of 15K to 30K to 60K to 80K to 120K last year. And now we'll see what this year holds, but it doesn't matter. This year only has to make enough money to pay my bills and to feed my family and to be happy and joyful. It doesn't need to be 100K. It doesn't need to be anything other than what it needs to be, right? If it is 100K, great. If it's 500K, amazing. If it's 80K, great. If it's 60K, doable. If it's less than that, I'd be kind of (laughs) sad. But like, it is what it is. We'll be fine. Like joy will find us either way, right? And that's the point is that when you let go and then you restart it and you come back and it's not even about a restart of like going back to a beginning. It's about restarting your perspective. So recontextualizing your perspective is a better word instead of restart. You're recontextualizing your perspective in a really profound way because you yourself is ha- are recontextualizing you as a human in a really profound way. You're actually changing as a person. And I would argue the more joyful you are, the more introspective you become, you actually go back to your core self. It's almost like you go back to the child version of you before all the trauma, before all the world got to you. You go back to that version of you that had dreams and aspirations. And it was not about domination. It was not about fear. It wasn't about hurting other people. It was about knowing the self. Matched at psychiatry for at Harvard and Mass General and McLean, which are like the best programs in the country. Um, uh-huh. I'm sure other people will disagree. UCLA is really good. Stanford's really good. Yale is really good. Hopkins is really good. Um, a lot of great, uh-huh. a lot of great programs. But uh, based on the academic status ladder, whatever that those were the the top programs in the country. Um, okay. And so I kind of found myself there. And then one thing that I quickly realized is I actually like I'm not like these people. So I remember uh-huh. like being in the line to get coffee at 4 p.m. with Mm, a fellow intern of mine. And he was an internal medicine intern. And man, like I was just talking to him about like medicine and like what he knew was just mind boggling. Like he was just so brilliant. And that was my experience. There's that people here are just like absurdly brilliant. And uh, I didn't even have imposter syndrome. I think it would have had, I would have had imposter syndrome if I didn't understand how to do this stuff with my mind. So I was like, all right, I ended up here anyway. So like, even if I don't belong, whatever. And then I actually like, once again, sort of leaned in on a different kind of compass of, okay, what do I want? And then my desires started emerging again because I started to get prominence. Um, I started to uh, achieve things there. I started to float to the top in some places, Mm -hmm. uh, even Uh in those institutions. And then I started to get ambitious. And then I started a private practice. And I had people coming to my office for my help who were CEOs of major companies and billionaires and things like that. And I was like, all right, this is what the goal is, right? It's to like Uh become an expert, become the best in the world at something and have people come to your office and pay you or companies pay you piles of money to go out there and and share your wisdom, which is like exactly what I wanted to do. And then I sort of realized a little bit after that, that this is silly. Like this is the same stupid ambition and that there's actually uh-huh. a class of people out there that need help just as much or even more who no one is helping. No one is even uh-huh. listening to, no one is even talking to. And those are degenerates I- on Twitch. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Before we move here, can I ask you a challenging question? I'm yeah. curious. Um, so my interactions with you are fairly limited, but I've seen a lot of your stuff. We've spoken a lot. Um, my perception of you is you're an incredibly intelligent individual. Um, I'm sure part of that has been through your upbringing. Part of that is probably uh, your parents are probably smart. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a mixture there. Do you think that um, 
you went through the the path that you did and rather than kind of like gunning for the top and being ultra ambitious and being obsessed with the prestige you did a lot of work to kind of like discover or build yourself up as a character and then the other stuff kind of came as a byproduct of that self-improvement that mental like self-improvement do you think that the same process would work to make most people successful if they weren't exceptionally bright or intelligent so say absolutely. you take a kid absolutely okay yeah yeah go. okay yeah you think so I'm give wait i'm gonna answer this too People will ask me this, like, who can be introspective? And the answer is, like, anyone. Okay? I used to think it was limited. But it's, like, anyone. But you do have to have a certain certain things available to you. You can't be in a coma. Okay? So if you're in a coma, yeah, you can't be introspective. Right? So you're going to be limited. So I'm answering this question, but through the uh, got, like through the perspective of introspection. Okay? So for me, everything is rooted in introspection. Right. You can you can be successful in a lot of ways, but my work is rooted in that. I think everyone can be introspective who has access to that. But like if in your coma, like I, I can't help you be introspective. Right. You're not awake. OK. But in general, I also believe this of people in the introspection world. Like I think ones can become fives. But again, it's very, very difficult. Right. It's just like so fascinating to me, this idea that I think what happens is like people who are smart or people who are quote unquote dumb are told like you'll never be smart. Oh, you're not naturally talented. Oh, you're so smart. You're so naturally smart. And so people start to create a divide and think like I'm the smart group and you're the dumb group. So you could never be smart like me. And oh, you're the smart group and I'm the dumb group and I'll never be smart like you. And I'm sitting here like stop comparing yourself. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy, as they say. It's never about other people. Joy is not about other people. Forgiveness is not about, isn't about other people. Boundaries is not about other people. It's about you. Introspection is not about other people. Extrospection might be, but introspection is about you. And yes, you find all of these things by you, you know, th with the tool of relationships. But it's always about you. You start with yourself. I desire to know more about myself. Then you go out into the world and you have relationships with people and they give you tools to what? Know more about yourself. So you begin with yourself, you reach out to the world and you end up with yourself all the same. Right? My partner and I always say like, he's the most important thing in his life and I'm the most important thing in mine. My favorite person in the whole world is him. So he's more important or equally as important as I am to myself. And he says, I'm his favorite person. And so I am equally important or more important as he is to himself. And therefore, when I say I am the most important person in the world, I'm also saying so is he to me, not to him, even though it's technically the same thing, but to me, because it's about where I place him in my life. I place him alongside me because I am him and he is me. And we have decided to do life together. We are in a partnership for life. But to anyone else, like, girl, do not make him the most important person on the planet, girl. He ain't yours. That'd be weird. So when you're looking at your life and you're saying, I am choosing to make this person a part of my life in a very specific way. I'm choosing to do this thing or have this belief. It's about you. You are choosing. You self-harmed. I self-harmed. I did it. The world made it feel like I have to hurt myself, but I chose to hurt myself. And the world is at fault for its own sins, but I'm not going to throw the stone, girl. Give me, give me your example. Yeah, I was going to say, say you take a kid who, you know, drops at a high, I'm giving you an extreme one, but 16, 17, um, speak, reads at a, you know, fourth or fifth grade reading level, not very bright, doesn't have very many interests or hobbies. And this kid's like, you know what, I'm going to go discover myself mentally. Do you think that this person would benefit in the same way that you did from that type uh, of yeah, yes. mental self-discovery? Yes. I am. I, I do not think anything is 100%, but I feel 100% mm -hmm. confident in that strategy. And here's why. Yeah. So you're, okay. you're, what do you think? I gained in that process. So if I have a character sheet, what uh -huh. do you think that got me? Do you think it got me XP? Do you think it got me skill proficiencies? Like, how do you conceptualize what I went through? Because you're saying, like, what um, I'm hearing you say is... Yes. Great fucking question. Oh, Dr. K is so on top of it. Great fucking question, Dr. K. Great fucking question. Yes. Mm. Oh, I just... Mm, what do you Ooh, I just, when he talks, he just like, yes, that's a great fucking question, my bro. 
It's a great fucking question. That's what I'm saying. Because when Dr. K talks, I hear anyone can go on this journey. But somebody else might hear and think, I have to go to Harvard to go on this journey. That's not even what he said, girl. That's not even what he said, girl. Anyone can go on the journey of knowing themselves. It's like, okay, is, is it predicated on your inborn talent? We'll get to that in a second. Uh -huh. That's kind of sure. what I'm hearing your question um, is. A little bit, yeah. The, the way that I would frame it is, or the way that I would see it is. I'm sorry. That's why, I, oh, that's why I'm so worried that the levels are going to become like, like an in-group of like, oh, we're fives and you're twos. And I'm like, uh, vomit. No, we're all the same. Fives and twos, they're the same. The only difference is the relationship you're having with yourself internally. And if you get to five and you think you're better than twos, you have failed the test. That means you're still not a five. That's not the point. Getting to a five is recognizing we're all the same. We're all the same. We kind of, I think as we grow up, in a society, um, even like the bumper bowling, I imagine, right? What? Does that mean? Do you, do you know what bumper bowling is? <laughs> Never mind. I'm so sorry. But like a lot of people have kind of like different rails or different restrictions on them. It's it's where you go bowling, but instead of gutters, they've got bumpers there for like four year olds. So you can't go on the gutter base. Not relevant. But um, yeah, that you grow up, you've got a lot of restrictions. You've got to kind of, you get a lot of thought patterns from society. You get a lot of like direction from people around you. And I guess going to a different environment with these guys allowed you to kind of like shed a lot of those societal expectations, a lot of those dispositions you had, and just let you really explore and build and work on yourself. And then once you kind of like fully fleshed out and understand yourself, you're able to re-engage with society and perfect. then explore those things. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Perfect, right? So now my question okay. to you is, so like we all go through life with the mm -hmm. instrument of our body, our mind, and I'm going to toss this word out there because I think it's complete. We can talk about this if you want to. And our soul. Okay? Okay. So we go th through the world always with us. Uh -huh. Like, you're, ocu like when, when you're, you're playing a first-person game here. Uh -huh. And you can't ever zoom out of it. Like, you're, you're you. And uh -huh. so what I learned in India and why I think it doesn't matter what your IQ is, and I've got uh, <laughs> evidence of sorts, but we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Is that all mm -hmm. I learned was how I work. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's like, if you don't know how a keyboard works, how effective are you going to be at typing? If you are blind to a keyboard, if you are numb mm -hmm. to your internal environment. Mm. And there are studies that show that there, there are six or seven neuroscientific deficits that lead to addiction. Mm. And one of them okay. is a lack of awareness of your internal environment. And what this clinically looks okay. like is someone will say, I don't know what happened. I slipped up. No, there's a whole series of subconscious stressors, yes. pressures, willpower degradation, lack of sleep. There's a thousand things that are going on, which is responsible for your behavior on this particular day. We're yes. just blind to it. Yes. Sure. So I, I think there are so many times during the day where I'm like, oh, why did I do that? And then I have to sit down and be like, why did I do that? Why wasn't I like, why wasn't I in my free, I call it being in my free will. Why was I like in my auto, not autopilot, but you know what I mean? Like, why was, why did I do that? And then I have to ask myself like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And there's always the reason. Now there's the easy reasons. Oh, maybe lack of sleep. Oh my God, it's the fibro. Oh my God, it's this. And I'm like, ah, let me like, let me keep digging. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? It's a it, like, what a great opportunity. You know what I mean? I think that, you know, anytime we're numb or blind to, and think about, just think about this for a second. If I am numb or blind to the driving forces, which doesn't mean they stop driving, it just means I'm not aware of them. Yeah. Right? And then what happens is, is actually exactly what you did with this conversation, which is I have this conflict between these two things, and I'm not trying to shit on you here, but it's a great example. Hard, I have a conflict yeah, yeah. between <laughs> these two things. And what is uh -huh. the logical answer? But the real answer that I'm offering, because this is my perspective, it's my bias, it's yeah. my experience, is that if you understand the origin of those two perspectives, it's not about which one is right, it's about where does this come from? Yes. And that that has very real utility. Mm. Uh -huh. And this is where, if you want to talk about evidence, so like from an anecdotal perspective, this is what I advocate for people like my patients and my clients and things like that. It's what I advocate to my kids. And I think that those people tend to be pretty happy. Um, they tend to have good outcomes. 
sometimes those outcomes are scary. Mm. Like makes uh-huh. me wonder whether I'm making a mistake and I've sought supervision around that. So for example, like uh-huh. 30% of people who come into my office within 12 to 18 months will change their job. And so I started getting okay. scared about like, am I biasing these people and pushing these people to, to make a change? Because that mm-hmm. shouldn't be happening. And then what I sort of ended up concluding is that as we start this process, what people realize is that they start shedding their conditioning or their socialization or living a life of shoulds and start gravitating towards what they want. They start changing their jobs. And okay. they tend to be like predominantly happy after that process and oftentimes paradoxically even more successful. Okay. This is where I relate to this part of my work. Now, I'm not in therapy. I do philosophy work, right? So like knowing yourself, working with the like, who is your consciousness? Like, what are you doing with your life? Like, this is what I do with my callers, if that's what you want to do. Not all my callers call to do one-on-one work. Some of my callers call just to shoot the shit and watch anime. So I love that. Those are some of my favorite callers. I love you all. Like literally some of my callers, like we play video games. Like sometimes we just talk. Like sometimes it's very fun. But some of my callers specifically call me to work on this kind of stuff. And by the way, you're not, you don't need to call me, you know, for some people you might want to talk to me for a year. And for some people they may need one call or two calls. The idea is that it's not about like, oh, I'm going to get a call from Brittany and I'm going to switch my whole perspective and everything will change. No, it's about what tools can I get within this time with Brittany to like take back home and meditate on, right? That's like, okay. So in my life, I started noticing a pattern where I would talk to people and they would break up with their partners. And I was like, oh my God, am I making everyone break up? And even my own mother was like, hey, every time you talk to someone, they dump their boyfriend. I was like, okay, in my defense, they were never meant to be together. And so there became this thing where Brittany, everywhere I went, like people would dump their partners. And I was like, oh, fuck. And like, I started to ask myself, oh shit, am I just breaking up the couples? But every, all the evidence I have, all the feedback I got was eventually like, thank you, God, you did that. Oh my God, you like saved my life or, oh my God, thank you. So now I have a little bit of confidence, a lot of bit of confidence that I'm mostly correct. And sometimes I get it wrong and my bad, but obviously it's not about, usually about relationships. I haven't, as far as I know, I haven't had a relationship regret my advice, but I've had like individuals say like, actually this worked better for me. I'm like, cool. But most of the time a change has to occur. I might just be wrong about the kind of change. Right. And so my mom called me the other day and she was telling me about this and she said, Oh, Betsy, my cousin calls me. I go, yeah. She goes, my cousin calls me and she goes, I got her on speakerphone and you know, my dad can hear. And you know, she goes asking very personal advice and I give her my advice and I hang up and your dad goes, should you be telling people these, this is a grown woman. You can't just tell her like not to do this with her life. And my mom goes, Shh. she called me. She asked for my advice. I tell her how it is. If she doesn't like it, she didn't have to call me. She called me. She wanted to hear the truth. So I told her the truth. Okay. This is my mom and I are twins. Okay. So I tell her, I'll, I've been there, girl. Do not ask me. You're fucking up. I hate when people ask me for my opinion. And they're like, why did Brittany tell me that you girl, did you ask me or did you ask me? Okay, girl. So then this woman calls my mom the next day, goes, oh my God, thank you. You saved my life. Holy fuck. I was about to make the biggest decision, like the worst decision of my life. My mom goes, you're welcome. And that's what I'm trying to say. Do not come to my mother or me for advice unless you want to hear some goddamn truth. And it's going to be biased because you're asking us. So it's going to be within the realm of our bias. Okay. My mom's going to get you more Catholic and I'm going to get you less. I'm going to get you more harm reduction. I cannot handle it when people come to me and they're like, oh, Brittany. Okay. Should I stop like cheating on my girlfriend? Yes. Oh my God. I can't believe you want me to stop cheating on my girlfriend. It's like, Jesus, why'd you ask me? You schmuck. Okay. And then there's also, I mean, if you look at now, we can talk about real evidence because my anecdotal experience ain't worth much, honestly, if we look at it scientifically. If we look at real evidence, Uh we can look at studies on mindfulness, on meditation, on developing narrative, on healing trauma. And and there isn't, I haven't seen, you know, any evidence, maybe that it's out there, but that, that this only works for people who are very talented. In fact, the whole point of mindfulness and the reason that we have it as an evidence-based intervention as a part of psychotherapy is it works for people on the autism spectrum. It works for people with Down syndrome. It works for people with low IQ, high IQ, Let's men, go. women, old, young. It Let's works go. for everybody Let's because go. it's a, it's a uh-huh. fundamental facet of like our wiring and it's how our brain works. 
Mm. And when we strengthen our frontal lobes, it helps us with impulse control. Let's go. Like that's like a neuroscientific fact. Let's fucking go. Act. So I, I don't think that, I mean, I'm happy to be challenged. Uh, uh -huh. I, I think it's a great question. This is why people will say, oh, Brittany's levels sound like borderline stuff. No, guys, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Meditation and philosophy helps mental health, spiritual health, disassociation. Philosophy, in conjunction with my therapy, helped my borderline. If I didn't have philosophy, if I didn't have spirituality, if I didn't have metaphysics, I don't think I would. I think I would have needed like 20 more years of therapy and I probably never would have gotten better. Spirituality the levels, philosophy, introspection in conjunction with therapy or maybe without, everyone has a unique journey, okay? So when I made the levels and everyone's like, oh, this is like DBT or this is like borderline stuff. I'm like, no, no. Listen to what Dr. K is saying. He's saying we use this tool within the bubble of therapy and mental health because it seems to help patients. Ma'am, that's my point. We, like, people would disregard my work because they're like, oh, it's just for people with borderline. Sure. Okay. I'll take all the borderlines and I'll help you, I promise. And at the same time, assuming you want the help, that's really key here. You have to actually want to change. If you don't want to change, I can't help you, right? Because you have to want to help yourself. But that's the confusion people are having. Mental health philosophy these are two different parts of the the human when i say you have to be a whole human being which is my version of like becoming a whole person okay mental health is separate from spiritual health therapy is separate from philosophy they're two different things they just happen to overlap sometimes and most of the time for people really benefit them but they're different but i i don't think it's specific to me okay yeah no i was just curious what your answer would be i think i mean i think i probably agree i, I think if you take a a person that is underachieving in school and then they become more introspective, self-reflective and get a greater understanding of themselves, it's harder to imagine, or it's hard to imagine that their life doesn't also significantly improve in other ways. Because my, my guess would probably be that those people that are in those bad situations are probably more inhibited than an average person when it comes to those introspective things. So Absolutely. opening that up would help them probably. Yeah, that, sure. that's, a, that's a brilliant assumption that you're making because that's like literally, that's what happened in my case and what we see a lot, right? So the worse your situation is, if we think about what... Yes, Kay. It's hard for people to realize that these tools and techniques have been around since literally before the Bible. Literally, the answers to the universe have always been here. It's just a matter of us discovering them. And yes. <sighs> Could you imagine if human beings stopped fucking going to war with each other and we just instead spent our whole life researching? I wonder what the world would be like, but we can't. And I can't want it because like that's not how it works and human beings are on a journey and the conflict is a part of it. But man, what a fantasy life. But I can't live for that potential because it won't happen. But in my dream life, we're all just researchers. We're all just that episode of One Piece, Do Not Spoil, where they're like, they all live in the tree and they're all just researching and they're all finding the answers to the universe and they don't make weapons of mass destruction. But if they do, they don't use it. I mean, that's my fantasy land. That's what I want to get to in this world. My bubble is the safe space where all I have to do is research and work I love my life and all I can do is learn and that's my life. All I need to do is learn. That is, I built my life. I'm building my life more and more every day to be stable enough where all I have to do is learn if that's what I want to do. Learn. Mm. What is the effect on a human being of a bad situation? It hurts. Uh -huh. And then our instinctive response when something hurts is to numb it because yeah. we haven't been taught how to fix it. So then we ignore it. Uh -huh. And then what we actually see is people in bad situations are more introspectively blind. I don't have, let me think about that. Mm. Mm. Maybe. I don't think that's an evidence-based statement, but that's no. my opinion. Wait. Blind. We actually see is people in bad situations are more, when something hurts, is to numb it. Because we haven't been taught how to fix it. Oh, so okay, hold on. It. I'll and, clarify. And then what we actually see is people in bad situations are more introspectively blind. Okay. He, I like that he corrected himself. I would say people who are in any situation without the right tools are more introspectively blind. 
it's assumed that if you're in a really bad situation, you're going to be more introspectively blind, but it's not because you're in a bad situation. It's because the bad situation probably doesn't offer you the tools. But if you're in a very good situation, like an incredibly wealthy, privileged situation, you also will be probably very low on the introspective scale because you won't have a reason to be introspective. The people I think are the most successful in life are the people with what I call like, this is a bad um sort of metaphor, but it's like the middle class existence. Life is kind of bad, but not totally bad. Life is kind of good, but not totally good. It causes just enough conflict with just enough tools to actually go perfectly on that journey of introspection. Now, don't don't internalize this as, oh my God, Brittany is saying I'm not going to be able, to, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's like a perfect formula. You can be in a very bad situation. Like I had a caller once who was really great. I loved her. She grew up in Section 8 housing, worked with the poor and homeless, was given like very minimal tools, but the right tools to get her to be interested in my content, to get her to ask the questions. She became a caller and to this day, I don't know what she did with her life, but I'm assuming she's doing great because she was born into one of the most difficult situations with all her whole family was basically ones. It was amazing. Like her story was so difficult, but she, the one person had just the right enough tools, right enough things, perfect, like born into the same environment her siblings were born into, but she had just the right tools to pop out of that bubble and realize like, I'm going to leave this bubble, aren't I? And I'm like, yeah, cool. And she's like, holy fuck. I was like, I'm so excited for you. And she has just the right trajectory to be very, like very successful in the introspective world. Right. So again, it's like, I'm not saying you have to be literally middle class. I'm just using an example of you have to be just the right amount of fucked up to just the right amount of okay to have just the amount of tools to kind of get where you need to go. Now, that's not saying you can't find it along the way. You absolutely can. You know what I mean? But there's something about like, again, she didn't grow up middle class. She grew up in poverty, but she grew up with that, like I said, the middle ground. She wasn't as fucked up as everyone else and wasn't as spoiled as everyone else. She had just enough to get her just enough tools to just be introspective enough to be like, holy fuck, I'm popping a bubble. I'm like, yeah, you are, girl. And she's like, holy shit. And I'm like, have fun. I'm da- I wish she would call me or I wish she would like let me know where her life went. I'm, I have such faith in her. She's probably doing great. But it must be so hard. What a journey. What an effing journey, bro. I don't have, let me think about that. I don't think that's an evidence-based statement, but that's Fair. my opinion. Yeah. Sure. I can imagine it being the case that depending yeah. on the I'm negative situations you grow up I'm in, really you examine that. negative behavior, it becomes normalized, and then you unleash that behavior into the world and you lose the ability to even analyze introspectively if it's good or bad in the way, because it's just what you've always seen or something, something like that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's worked for me. Now, I, uh-huh. I think there's there's also like a couple things to notice. I, I mean, the path that I'm on is financially less than the path that I used to be on. I believe right? that. So there are costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then in terms of how do I navigate that, I really think about what's the point of money. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, it's not a way of keeping score. It's, I mean, sure, like I could buy more stuff, but like, you know, I, I, I don't. Okay. So I have this like little fantasy in the back of my head, also a fantasy We're like, I have this retreat center, but it's not really a retreat center. It's like a research center. And then people just come and all we do is research all day and like share what we like thought about or discovered that day. And then that's it. That's all we do all day. But I know drama is going to happen. I know y'all going to fuck each other. I know y'all going to create drama and hierarchies and who's hot and who's not. And then after a while, there's going to be a click. And that's why I moved for solitude. I love people. But even if I started this research center, which was very like platonic and no one's going to fuck, you know, you all are going to turn into a sex cult and you guys are going to fuck it up because that's what happens. <laughs> but I have this like little fantasy of creating like a, like a library that's like just for, maybe I could create a library that literally you can't talk in, but you know, people going to fuck when they leave the library and the drama is going to ensue and somebody's going to do something shitty. Oh, humans, man, humans, bro. I mean, I'm, I'm a degenerate gamer. Like, what do I need money for? Yeah, no, so, I know. What so, you mean, yeah. Like some amount of security and stuff is really important, right? So, and and that's also mm-hmm. where when I sort of think about it, like being freed of my internal drivers, I can kind of make a logical decision about how much do I want to do for free. Yeah. Um, so even if you look at like the pricing in my private practice, there was one point where 
there was at one point 50 to 70 percent of my patients were free care yeah and it was oh, my financial situation was fine because i charged enough to the other 30 to 50 percent mm-hmm. and i had a uniform financial policy which was you know this is what my rate is pay what you can okay so the, the i think some of those kind of the the dust kind of settles i don't know how like once you, once you're internally like your compass is is set then you sort of like can logically think through st- <laughs> true z king true everybody starts fucking in the library and i'm like i'm gonna put this library in the sand this is it this is what's gonna happen also ingrid no organizing the orgies <sighs> What a mess. Humans are so messy. Like, okay, literally, like, it sounds, okay, that sounds like a dream. It sounds like a dream, but it's not a dream because humans are going to fuck it up. That's the problem. I love humans, but they will absolutely fuck it up, even if it's with my inner circle. You guys, my own inner circle, I cannot keep us from fighting and bickering and creating conflict. I cannot create human. I cannot create an environment where conflict does not arise the moment you have a bubble against a bubble. When you're learning and you're researching, you're also experiencing bias. Who are you reading about? Who are you consuming? And then when you come together that night and you discuss like what you discovered, somebody in the group is going to say, actually, that's not true. Because none of us are working off objective words. We're working off the subjective interpretation from people outside of certain things. So it doesn't matter if I created this like amazing library of knowledge, where are we getting the knowledge from? Which books am I putting in the library? Oh, all the books? Great. How many of you are patient enough to read 10,000 of them before making an opinion? Because like that's the thing. We would have to read all of the books and then come together and be like, what is this? What is this? What is this? And then we would still have conflict. But that would be fun. Oh my God, I just got a little wet. I would love to be in a library space where like we just read like 10,000 books. I mean, I'm already 2,000 in. We could read another 10,000. Like that's, we could do that. Man, okay, maybe I'll make the library, but no fucking. Okay? The library, but no fucking. Okay, that's going to be the rule. Stop and it kind of settles. Oh. Okay, that makes sense. I think um, I-, I have like a similar idea. I don't know how well I follow it, but I have a similar idea kind of to what you're saying. I think in the business world, have you ever heard the term like first principles? I've heard the term. I don't know what it means. Yeah. Just basically, like, how, like, what are you orienting yourself towards? Like, what are you about? Like, what are you trying to do? Yeah. And what you're saying is, like, anytime somebody would come, like, for advice, like, I don't know, where do I want to go to college? What do I want to do for a job? Blah, blah, blah. Kind of like what you're saying. Like, those questions are never really important. The important question is, like, well, you know, what do you want to accomplish or who do you want to be in, like, five or ten years or whatever? And then once you have, like, those, like, very fundamental questions figured out, all of the other questions become pretty simple. Yeah. So I think kind of what you're saying about, like, um, figuring out kind of, like, the internal area of like what does it mean to you know take a pill or where does self-judgment come from or anything like that then once if i've like figured out those types of things then the questions about like medication or not are really difficult questions at all they kind of fall into line very simply is yeah yeah and i, I think that that's uh, so there's like scientific uh, support of that so like even uh, so part of the reason i started a coaching program was because I thought that there are some of these things like coming down to first principles were not emphasized in the mental health space So just Uh one example of that is the number one variable that correlates with vulnerability of pornography addiction is meaninglessness in life, in life. Mm -hmm. Watch the meaning crisis by John Verveke. It's really, 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 really good. Really, really good. Why don't you start a book club? We had a book club on the discord for a while. It's really difficult actually. Um, It's really great, but it's also like, it's motivated by people showing up. It's a difficult like thing for me. I'm crowd work is difficult. So like when I imagine a research library, I'm not really thinking of like, us doing it together. A book club is something you do together. When I'm thinking of a research facility and just it's a library of research, I'm not thinking of us doing it together. I'm thinking of all of us just being in our own worlds, researching all day. And then if we want to come together at night, we share what we researched. But when you do a book club, that's not what you're doing, right? You're all reading the same thing. You're all doing the same thing. It's not the same. And plus, it's not the ambiance. I want like a, you know, Belle in Beauty and the Beast, how he opens up the library for her. (laughs) Now that is a gift. Fuck the rings. I want a library. Oh, if I could just gift myself a library. Oh, girl. Okay. So, but if we sort of think about it, we actually have evidence-based approaches to cultivate purpose and meaning and direction, which are all introspective. 
Interesting. But, and so what, what happens, if you look at the literature on positive psychology, <sighs> when you cultivate introspection, the rest of the stuff falls into place. And yes, the, ma'am. W- the whole reason behind purpose, and this is why we teach so mm-hmm. much about dharma or, or dharma, right, is once you mm-hmm. have that north star, then stuff starts to fall in place. And the more important okay. thing yes. is that... So your north star is like your purpose, Okay, you'll hear people say that. What's my North Star? What's the thing guiding you through life? That's like, do you get it? The North Star. I love that. Like, what's your thing guiding you through life? What's the purpose? And if you want, us again, if you want to watch John Verveke on YouTube, he also did a talk recently with Theo Vaughn. It was really, really good. So if you want to watch, if you go to Verveke's Meaning Crisis and it's a little too philosophy for you, you can go to his talk with Theo Vaughn and get a much more watered down, digestible version of his work. That's really, 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 really amazing. Yeah. And, and then we just ha- we see these scientific benefits, which is that even though we're not treating pornography addiction, you just have to have a reason to not watch pornography. Like you have to have something in your life that is guiding you, pushing you. Because what, what happens with pornography addiction or video game addiction is it just fills up the empty space in your life and it drags you down i can't remember sure i think there's a lot of um antisocial mm. behavior that falls into this like when you ask like a like a prep school kid you know like what did you have to do in your life to not commit armed robbery they don't really have an answer because they were going to school in the morning for band practice they were doing football practice after school their mom and dad picked them up they were like there's there's not even a question of why you would do that because that kind of like thing in your life was filled by so many other things so but this seems to track from what i understand yeah yeah <clears throat> mm-hmm. Okay. Did, did we get to uh, yeah. your original concern about, I mean, do you want to talk more about stimulants and kind of outcomes and what to expect? Okay. So, mm, no, never mind. Then how to think about it? Sure. I have one more big question on that. If Sure. Yeah, if you want to, and then you can go from wherever, yeah. Um, I'm not, so um, another thing that's difficult for me, whew, okay, we're changing gears significantly. Okay, so um, pre versus post taking some kind of like mind altering medication. Okay. Um, something that's very difficult for me Great is question. how do you figure out what is a positive effect of a drug that's helping you live a better life versus what's just like you being high and like having a good time. Okay. This is a this is a great question. The question you have to ask yourself when you're doing drugs, when you're smoking weed, a lot of people will make a comment about my work and be like Brittany's the result of doing too many drugs or Brittany's a girl who had one good acid trip and she's like guys guess what and I'm like yeah so there's those people in that category and then there's somebody like me and John Verveke and Matt Delahanty and other people who like do drugs as an experimental form of meditation to get themselves to have a better understanding of their consciousness and some of us land in other areas Matt's like a perfect little two in his little atheist bubble and I think John Verveke personally my opinion I think he's more of a four or five five in my opinion could be wrong Jordan Peterson's definitely a two maybe a three who's like stuck in this like world and then there's like all these, you know, everyone's having this um, sort of relationship with themselves and their work. But I, I do think like there is a power to drugs, but it's a great question to ask. Am I introspective or am I just high? And, and one of the key points to this is how does this reflect in your sober life? Now, when you're doing an ADHD drug, it's a little different, but I will say I am very pro medication. If it will help you, I'm a big fan. I think it totally works. But I also think that the relationship you're having with the medication should be one you've made because it is the right decision. Like eating healthy is the right decision. And these drugs are there to benefit you and to help you stay in like on task. Like you already had the intention of staying on task, right? So you already know that's you. But the problem is you have a deficit in your brain. So the ADHD meds help you stay on the task you already intended to do. So not changing your worldview, right? On weed, you might need it in a pain relieving way, in a meditative way. You might need it just to chill and have fun for the night. Geez, not all drugs are meant to be meditative. Sometimes I just want to have fun, right? So then there's the other thing. So what I do is I tell myself, okay, why before I take this drug am I doing this drug? And I decide before I'm intoxicated. Why am I getting drunk, which is very rare for me. It's usually like once a year, I might have a beer or I'll have beer at dinner in Croatia because everyone drinks beer, but I'm like drunk halfway through my beer. It's very funny. I've gotten drunk in front of my in-laws because I had half a beer and I was like, oh my God, and I am a mess drunk. So why am I smoking weed? Why am I doing shrooms? Why am I, I decide before I do the drug. 
Most people do drugs and then decide why they're doing drugs. But I did drugs way later in life, so I got to really choose why I was doing drugs in the first place. Why am I doing BDSM? Same thing. I did BDSM at 21. I'm 34. So I got to choose why I was doing BDSM. I didn't just do it because it was there. I did it because I sought it out. I chose it. I learned about it. I was mentored in it. I took it very seriously. So again, the question is, why are you on ADHD meds? Usually because you already have a task you want to do and you just need help getting on task, right? That's a pretty good reason to take your ADHD meds, right? So the ADHD meds aren't changing you. They're facilitating the thing you already want to do. So I don't smoke weed if it's going to ruin a goal of mine. So if I want to do a goal and I say, ooh, but if I smoke weed, I can't attain my goal, I don't smoke weed. Now, of course, I'm in Croatia, so I'm not smoking weed at all. <laughs> sober since May. <laughs> weed sober since May, you know? So it's, you know, intentions. Yes, K says fact, I sent facts, I sent intention for everything. Exactly, intentions. Even for the day I wake up in the morning, and I go, okay, what are we doing today? What are my intentions for today? What are my spoons? How much energy do I have today? And then what can I get done today? And you know, when I'm in sync, when I choose the right way to use my spoons, girl, I'm on top of it. Let me tell you. Uh, so some, some real examples I'll give of this is um, there's a lot of things that seem to overlap in terms of like getting high and then also like uh, not having ADHD. So I don't know how many of these things are true, but I've read something that like if you sometimes overeating can be like a factor when it comes to ADHD people. That if you have like a bag of cookies, every time you walk by, you wanna grab one, Ooh, even if you're not necessarily cookies. hungry. And then I notice that like, if I've had amphetamines, uh, I can have anything in the house and I just won't eat it because I'm not tempted to. But like, am I actually making the choice, making a better choice to not do that? Or am I just- Also, I don't know about his medication. Everyone's different. It does take a lot of time for people to regulate under their medication. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to like, a like know yourself two weeks into doing your meds. I don't know every every medication. I'm not a doctor. I'm just saying as a person who's been around people who have had to acclimate to their meds, it does take a bit. So, you know, give you give yourself some time to get used to the things. It's too high to want to eat. And there's a oh, lot of I, I, there's like, ne yeah, go neither, ahead. neither, neither. So so let's understand okay. the neuroscientific mechanism be, behind behind why you eat cookies when you have ADHD. OK, OK. I mean, this yeah, is okay, general generality. This is great. This is like a of med course. school question. So let's mm -hmm. understand this, right? So why do you eat cookies if you're not hungry? So people with ADHD are impulsive, which means that they engage yeah. in impulsive behavior. So if you look at mm -hmm. like even the packaging on a cookie. Wait. Could Steven's ADHD be the reason he cheats? I'm just saying like cheating is kind of impulsive to some people, which is why they don't feel so bad that they do it. Uh, but to be fair in his situation, I don't. I don't know if that's impulsivity or a hyper focus because it makes me wonder like a lot of the time people are upset when I criticize cheating. It's because they're like, I just did it, Brittany. You don't understand. And I'm like, right, because you lack discipline to not put yourself in a situation where that's a thing or slash to keep yourself disciplined in in the guise of temptation. I got it. But that's something to think about how your neurodivergency could actually cause you to act to act in a way that you think like, like you remember when Steven told me like he's only in an open relationship because he can't help it but cheat. Like he literally did, can't help it. It's like when you hear the red pill guys say like, I've tried it. I can't help it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I need multiple women. It's like, okay, well maybe this is like your neurodivergency. Maybe you have ADHD. Maybe you have like an addiction problem. Maybe you have, it's like, instead of actually asking themselves, why do I cheat? Or why do I need different women? They just go, I'm a man. And I'm like, maybe it's something like this, right? Like this would be really, really, really interesting. You know what I mean? To kind of figure out, is this like actually why this is happening? That would be really cool. See, this is where I'm like, ooh, why do I do that? Like, why do I do that? Why do I do that? I'd bet $5,000 that's why he cheats. I mean, very possibly, right? It could be, it could be related. Like if I'm being honest, that's so, maybe we're not, project we're not we're not saying it is i'm just saying if for your own life this could be this could be the packaging on a, on a cookie is designed to evoke an impulse so you have uh -huh. i'm not saying corporations are evil or anything like that but it's not my area of expertise but you we all know mm -hmm. that corporations design cookie companies design packages to evoke impulses and then you have a uh -huh. brain that is vulnerable to impulses 
in a way that is so normally what happens in the brain is we have all kinds of no no you don't get to blame ADHD for the cheating you get to understand why you have an impulse to cheat right so again we're not looking for excuses we're looking for explanations instead of just oh I guess I'm a cheater I guess I just I'm shitty to my partners and I'm shitty to myself Guys, do you want to be the guy who's just shitty to his partners and shitty to themselves? Or do you want to be a person who's like, hey, maybe there's something fucking wrong with me because I'm a grown up and I should be able to stop fucking strange pussy. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Integration of signals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have, for example, like a glucagon level and a leptin level and a ghrelin level. And all of these mm -hmm. like levels, insulin, glucagon, leptin, and ghrelin are all in some fucking tango to tell you Rapid when to eat a cookie yeah. okay mm -hmm. so what happens in the case of adhd is it's kind of like an impulsive behavior since it's around and there's an environmental trigger in a sensory input before you even realize what you're doing and you don't even realize it's not a conscious choice it's just like an impulse that you give into because your capacity to restrain impulses is low so this is why, for example, like, uh, you, you know, people with ADHD benefit from cool, uh, clean areas because mm. what you really want to do is extend. So, so the key thing about impulses is, let me just think about how to say this. Yeah, sure. So if you're someone with ADHD and you're struggling with impulsive behavior, the main thing that you need to understand is that the impulse is not sustained. It's an impulse. So oh. what you really need to do... Oh. If, if you get distracted is you need to ride out the impulse. So what's happening, okay. the reason people in, in our society are getting fucked right now by ADHD is because our society is greasing the wheels for impulsive behavior. So this uh -huh. used to have a lock code. And now uh -huh. it has a thumbprint. Now it has face ID. So if an uh -huh. impulse lasts half a second, I can pick up the phone. And the phone remembers which website. Now I have an, a notification too. So I have an impulse for one second. And in that second, what can happen? I can look at the phone. The phone auto unlocks. I don't even have to try to unlock it. I just have to point the phone at my face. And then it auto unlocks. I see a notification. I click on the impulse. There go 30 minutes. Yeah, I noticed um, when I grab the phone, I'm just like this. And I'm like, I always click it. And then I go, why did I open my phone? And then I'm like, why don't I open my phone? Like, it's almost habit. Like, I don't even think, like, I just have this, like, habit. And then I go like this. And I click it really fast. I put in my code so fast. And then I'll go straight. I'll do this. I'll go straight. I have, like, a pattern of behavior. I'll go. I'll read my comments. I'll look at my analytics. And then I go to TikTok. And I'm, like, scroll. And it's, like, a habit. I have, like, a ritual. And then I'm, like, fuck, why did I pick that up? And then, like, even, um, like, with my partner when he's talking, I'll notice myself, like, if my brain starts to like wander up like I'll go like this and I'm like oh yellow I think I'm losing interest and he's like oh okay hold on and I'm like oh what what so yeah it's interesting like I'm not I don't have ADHD as far as I know <laughs> but um just like the habit the habit forming is like it's so fascinating so what happens with stimulant medication is we are restraining the impulsiveness Okay. Which I don't think that you're making, con you weren't making conscious decisions in either case, right? Your brain is processing that a cookie is there. It's just the impulse is controlled by whatever other directed behavior. I want a cookie. Oh, fuck. Don't you all want a cookie now? No, I want a cookie. Gotcha. Okay. That's, it's hard to, nom, 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 nom. emotionally, it's hard to process that. But I mean, intellectually, it makes sense. Yeah. 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 So what makes it hard for you to intellectually, uh, emotionally process that? This is great. Things mm. are coming full circle. Mm -hmm. um, well, because intellectually, everything you're saying makes sense. Um, I, I, I feel like as people, I, I think we tend to think oh. of ourselves as being more cognitive than we actually are. So things like impulses don't like fit into our cognitive 
understandings of ourselves. Like, why would I do something on an impulse? I'm choosing to do every single thing I'm doing. So the idea that like, now I'm not making a really bad choice, but it's not a choice. It's just an impulse that I'm not acting on. That's like, it's just a hard thing to emotionally intuit for me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Does so, that make sense? Yeah. yeah it okay. makes a lot of sense. But I think it like, so let me tell you what I heard. Okay. You sure. said, mm -hmm. is this, am I not eating because I'm hot? I thought you had ADHD. I mean, girl, even my partner, my partner the other day, he was like holding me. He's like, should we get you diagnosed for ADHD? And I was like, what? And he was like, well, the way you just reacted could be related to ADHD. And I was like, oh, I mean, maybe. And like, I just, it's so funny. Cause like I could be, my, my brother has ADHD. My sibling has autism. So I'm like, mm, like maybe like I could, you know, but I probably probably do have some variation of it, right? But it is funny because like I did I did an action this last weekend, this weekend, where he was like, "That was kind of ADHD of you. Should we get you diagnosed?" Because it was like a, and I was just like, like because sometimes I do like my brain becomes like so over like it's like a very anyways it doesn't matter. I, yeah, versus the ADHD. So like, what is the emotional valence of each of those options mm. does that question uh, make well, sense well it's yeah it, it's full circling back to the um to the original question of um i guess of like the character question kind of or am i <clears throat> so so let's where... let's say one of those things is true how wh wh how do you yeah. feel about yourself yeah, yeah there's a different judgment like absolutely if I'm not eating yeah exactly yeah in I'm both not cases it's a negative judgment I'm... Well, you see that? Because on, on yeah, the one but, hand, oh, yeah, oh, fuck, right? Fucking Steven is get, taking his fucking high pills, and sure, uh -huh. he's not eating cookies, which would be progress, but why aren't we eating cookies? Because we're fucking high. You see well, that? Well, there's one, so like the, the, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, I slightly disagree, but I, I understand what you're saying. The difference here is I think I largely have kind of sort of made peace with myself in terms of like taking the the drug but the the rationalization in my mind is that like i think taking the drug is okay as long as i'm elevating myself to just a baseline level of impulse control Why so if it is the case that i'm doing mm. the medication appropriately and i'm at a baseline level of impulse control and i'm not doing this that's good but if i'm like overshooting and i'm just like abusing drugs that's the bad part yeah, right right so but what i'm saying is like <laughs> think about like so this is a uh, the study is rigged like i know that you've reconciled mm -hmm. it that's fine but what i'm saying is this shit is still lurking because Mm -hmm. What was so when when you gave me okay you gave me two options right well, option number one yeah. is like I've got ADHD and that's why I'm eating cookies, mm -hmm. and option sure. number two is I stopped eating cookies. But why does your mind generate such a judgmental hypothesis for mm. option two? Mm. Um, well, if it's because I'm just super high, then it's just because I'm abusing drugs to shortcut like the growth and character that I should have. But, to but do you, stop, do you yeah. see how, like out of the thousand things that you could have said, uh, there's a thousand, there's a differential diagnosis. There are a thousand hypotheses why you're not eating the cookies. Which one does your mm -hmm. mind settle on? Well, obviously the drug, right? Right. So that's coming from you. Do you see what I'm saying? Like that thing is still active. Mm -hmm. Well, because but I mean, I am doing it, right? Like that's, that's yeah, a yeah, part of my reality. Like, so you, so, but that, that's what I'm kind of saying is you're doing it and you've reconciled mm -hmm. on an intellectual level, but that part of you that is frustrated with yourself for being weak, which by the way mm -hmm. is if I had to bet money, right? So this is the most common thing. Okay. So like that's the part that always like that when you would, again, you don't, you can rationalize yourself into doing anything, but to fully accept it, to fully be like, this is good for me. Right? Like, this is actually a choice I'm going to make because it's the right choice and not hold the judgment of like, I need pills is like very specific. I actually kind of went through a journey a year ago when I was getting diagnosed with fibro where I was like, oh, I'm tired because I'm sick, but also I'm allowed to be tired just as a human in general. I think sometimes when you're like a, a very like, quote unquote, you're fighting ambition and you're doing all that stuff. You run into the cycle of like, you should never get tired. You should work a hundred hours a week. You should do this. Da, 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 da. And then you realize like, Hey, you know, just like as a person, you can be tired. You don't have to blame the borderline or the PTSD or the fibro. You could just be tired. It's like, sometimes we rationalize this thing to justify this thing that we already feel shame for. It's very human. It's very normal. But I love that Dr. K is trying to explain to him that you don't need to worry about abusing drugs. You should give yourself a 
like an understanding that like you're taking a medication that's going to benefit you and there's nothing wrong with that. Destiny has so much internalized shame, which is to be fair, what he's expressing in this video. This is like one of the greatest Destiny moments, Stephen moments I've seen where Stephen is genuinely saying like, hey, I, you know what I mean? Like, this is a struggle I'm having. I have this shame from the way I was raised. And like Dr. K is trying to get him to really understand it, but he's rationalizing too hard that he's not like emotionally understanding that. And you know, trauma from being raised as an ADHD kid, I think Dr. K is actually going to maybe talk. Yeah, he's going to talk about it in this section. Okay, let's get through this. Oh, <gasps> Do we have, okay, I think we have like 20 more minutes with Destiny. Yeah, we have about 20 more minutes with Destiny. I am getting so hungry. I've got a little bit of food, a food headache. Um, so we're going to finish this up and then, okay, let's finish this up. We have about 20 more minutes, actually. I think he's going to mention this, but the trauma, oh, anyway, he'll mention it. He'll mention it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go. I think if you look at research on this, people with uh -huh. ADHD have harsh self-judgments. And so uh -huh. the way that the self-judgment manifests in your mind is by, it's like a, it's like a study bias. Like the options that it generates for you are rigged. The reason, am I too high to, no, you're not too high. I mean, I don't think so. Right? Uh -huh. So we also know, for example, that a stimulant medication uh, suppresses appetite. One of the major uh -huh. concerns about giving it to kids is that it can interfere with like things like growth and stuff like that, which thankfully it's not yeah. too bad. Um, but, uh -huh. but you know, th there could be a neuroscientific, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as high, but that's what I mean is like you pick, you pick such a judgmental characterization as an option which I think is significant. Mm. Sure. I guess it's just because that's the thing I'm trying to avoid because I know that Abs um, taking said medication is going to improve my life in these ways. But like, if it's too much, it's probably... <laughs> yeah, does that right. make sense? So, so, so the, the things that you're anxious or worried about, right? That's that emotional energy. And that, when you uh -huh. say it's, it's a brilliant insight that this is emotionally not sitting with me. And then the question is uh -huh. why? It's because you're emotionally in the opposite direction. <laughs> Well, like, let's say, so hypothetically, let's say I, I, like, let's say that I fix this, okay? What's, what's to, um, what's to prevent me from saying, okay, so like, here, t talk me down from this one. And I'm not saying I'm doing this. And this is all hypothetical. Sorry, I'm not asking for medication advice. But like, let's say theoretically, that like, I solve all these issues. I figure something, you're like, I don't have any negative judgments whatsoever. Um, you know, forget these things. I'm just going to do, uh, you know, 100 milligrams of methamphetamine every day, because I have no judgments about this anymore. It improves my life in all these different ways. I'm doing so better here. Like, what's the back away from the cliff there as opposed to right now where you're saying I'm probably too far in the other direction of being too judgmental? Like, how well, would you, yeah, so what's the balance? I would say yeah. it's just like any other medication, right? So like okay. you would have a relationship with your stimulant, the same that you do with like, let's say a cholesterol medication. Or oh, I super disagree with this. I want to hear you. Yeah. Rationalize this for me. Cause I have a hard time figuring this one out in my mind. I have like, um, behavioral modifying medication that works in your brain I, I separate that way somebody in the comments said he's mourning his flawed biology i think there's something when you're really introspective and you're smart or you're really smart in some area or you're some genius or the smartest kid in the class or the smallest smartest kid in the orbit you might you might need to reevaluate that idea of smartness when you realize like you have a neurodivergency or a flaw I think Steven uses the word neurodivergent in this conversation where there's like, oh my God, wait, am I just autistic? Wait, am I like ADHD? And because you spend your whole career or life memeing about those things, like, oh, you're so autistic, you're so on the spectrum, blah, 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 and then you realize you are one of them, which let's be real, anyone in this sphere is definitely on the spectrum. Like, come on, like, that's why we all like each other. Like, okay, we're all something. If you play D&D, &D, you're probably on the fucking neurodivergency spectrum, whatever that means, okay? I just feel like, there are certain hobbies that attract certain kinds of people, okay? Um, and we're all in this together, kids. <laughs> so, okay. So, again, I I think this is like the conflict is that we've so associated versus me. My brain is like, hey, when I hear like borderline who's getting better, I'm like, cool. When I hear autism, I'm like, cool. When I hear ADHD, I'm like, cool. I like a neurodivergent girl. Like, I, I'm so lucky I married a neurodivergent person. I don't think I could have been with someone who wasn't neurodivergent. I see it as, like, a plus because now they understand me and I understand them better. Not that all neurodivergents understand all neurodivergents. But there is a part of society that seriously looks at you very judgmentally. And then you internalize that judgment. For some reason, growing up, 
I don't think we internalized it bad because to be honest, like my mom, when I was younger, someone did tell her to get me di like diagnosed for AD ADD. That was what we called it at the time. She goes, hey, you should see Brittany has ADD. She really has like the tenants. My mom's like, she's perfect the way she is. So my parents were like, no diagnoses. You're perfect the way you are. So by the time we got old enough to get diagnosed with things, when I got diagnosed, I just felt relieved I had an answer for my behavior. But for somebody else who might be not looking at their behavior as bad. See, I was looking at my behavior like something is wrong. But I think Steven might see his behavior as nothing is wrong versus I would say his addiction to work, his lack of presence by avoiding living near his child, his chronic cheating, like all of these are red flags of something. And they could just be impulse control. They could be neurodivergency. They could be childhood trauma, which I think Dr. K is going to mention to him now that just because you you know you have ADHD doesn't mean you've healed your childhood trauma because childhood trauma from undiagnosed ADHD is a real thing. Okay. So again, when we look at ourselves and we think everything in our life is perfect, why isn't it working? We might have a hard time with the diagnosis versus my life was like, hey, something is going severely fucking wrong. So when I got a diagnosis, I was like, whoo, we have an answer, kids. And now I could work towards it. I had a goal. Right. So I think from my understanding of what Steven's saying in the bubble where people are genuinely struggling with because they think like life is great. Nothing's wrong with me. Well, hearing something is quote in quotes wrong with you might be too much to handle. That's what I think might be ha happening maybe versus again, when I get diagnosed, I'm like relieved we have an answer for a problem I can now solve because now I know myself better. But for some other people, again, they might think, oh no, something's wrong with me. And I'm like, you know, something was wrong and that's why I got a diagnosis. So I'm relieved I have an answer. Oh, <gasps> yay. Welcome to, welcome to Open With Boundaries. The Dolma video is coming out very soon. I just have to edit it differently than like right but, yeah, but, like but hold on a second yeah, yeah. because what, what was the premise that we started with that we dissolved this stuff right okay so when we dissolve that stuff it's be it, it's behavior modifying so what there's no emotional energy behind that mm -hmm. i need this medication in the same way that i need cholesterol medication there's no judgment or yeah but i feel like it. but i feel like i feel like the difference is that like I can't do anything mentally about like my triglyceride levels or my triglyceride levels. I can't do anything mentally about my HDL or LDL. Like right. I can't so, think these problems away. Yeah. So but, that, but, the, but, but the do, medication. Do that, there... that... All right, Jessica, you're getting a little too like passionate in the comments. You are not your thoughts. We are not our thoughts. We are a combination of our ideas and how our ideas get implemented into action. But you can't be a thought because if I was a thought, I would have killed myself a thousand times. If I was a thought, I would have stabbed a hundred people. If I was a thought, like we have intrusive thoughts. We have thoughts in our head all day that aren't our thoughts. Like they're just thoughts that are going in our head, like on autopilot. Like maybe your brain doesn't do this, but my brain does. Oh my God. Hi, Lola. Welcome. Welcome to the memberships. Yay. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I feel so honored. I'm going to cry. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So, so Jessica, when you say like we are our thoughts, like maybe your brain works in a way where you have no thoughts, but I have thousands of thoughts that I definitely are not a part of my ideas. I have thousands of thoughts in my head all day and none of them are the ideas that I implement into real life. Right? So when you say like, I know. Oh, ooh, we need a cupcake emoji. Okay, guys, I'm going to work on a cupcake emoji. You're one observing the thought. Yeah, you're the one observing the thought, right? So again, like I have thoughts of violence because I'm afraid and I want to be, I want to defend innocent people, but I don't act on those thoughts because they don't coincide with my ideas. People impose their thoughts onto us, therefore changing or altering our thoughts. Again, you're interchangeably using thoughts with ideas. Thoughts and ideas are two different ideas. Like they're two different concepts, right? Thoughts are not ideas. Ideas are not thoughts. But to have an idea, you have to have thoughts, right? If you want to use words that satisfy you personally, then fine. So again, like you... If I was defined by my intrusive thoughts, I'd be a horrible person. It'd take a long time to reconcile that. Exactly. I am a thought. Yes, Z King. We are all thoughts. But like, that's a joke. T-H-O-T. -T. Okay. So again. Okay. So thoughts are not ideas, but to have an idea, you need a thought. And what you do is you scramble through all your thoughts to come up with a good idea. And the idea usually becomes action. Right? 
How do you integrate a thought into an idea? Like when you're trying to improve yourself? Okay. I think all the time about how I need to work out because I want to have mommy muscles. But right now, I'm not going to have mommy muscles if I don't work out. But then I have to think about how to work out and I have to think about, I have to have the thought about working out. So first I imagine working out and I see myself working out. I'm like, oh, that's a nice thought. And then I have to get the thought into an idea so I can actually implement the action. So, okay, if I work out, if I want to fulfill this thought, I can get healthier by helping my fibromyalgia by working out and I can get mummy muscles. Ooh, and my OF will pop off even better, right? P.S. My OF is popping right now. It's so good. So you can join the OF because the OF will look good because I'll work out. And this idea coincides with my goal for my job, which works with my values. And it's a win-win. I get better OF customers because I look better. I get better health and I work on my fibromyalgia. And now this thought has become an idea that coincides with my values that now is going to get turned into an action. Right. That's how I would do it. But that, that, that's that's the, your hypothetical is flawed because okay. you're injecting your judgment into the hypothetical. Because look at look when I tell you, then it becomes just like any if if we don't See? attach any judgments to stimulants, if we di mm -hmm. dissolve okay. that that judgment, yes. we don't no longer judge things. Then what happens is then it's just like any other medication. Like, Yes. Oh my gosh. Discourse said there's a reason why propaganda and marketing work so well. Thoughts and ideas are influenced by outside conditioning when you're not actively conscious while you go around life. Yes, I agree with that. I think if you're not introspective, you'll think thoughts are ideas and you'll think other people's thoughts are your ideas and then you'll become like sort of a clone. Right? So I think that's really important. Sometimes our brains, like there's this TikTok I love where this girl's like, I think intrusive thoughts are like your intuition. And then the guy goes, eh, eh, eh. Not you and me. You and me are intrusive thoughts. We don't listen to those because some of us have thousands of thoughts a day that are just thoughts. You're supposed to see them and let them go by. Jessica, I really, really recommend meditation and I really recommend meditating your thoughts and looking at them and putting them where they belong in the right category and having a relationship with your thoughts. It sounds like you're struggling with sort of the concept of like what are your thoughts and who they are. Like your ideas are who you are. But your thoughts, if we're talking about the literal conception of a thought, this voice in our head that comes in and out, sometimes it's not even like my voice. Sometimes it's just a voice of like a thought. Like, oh, what if I stepped into the street? Oh, what if I kicked this dog? It's like, I'm not going to kick the dog. That's crazy. But sometimes I have a thought of like, what if I kick this person? What if I trip this lady? What if I, it's like not my thought. It's just like an intrusive thought, right? So that might help, right? They're just like thoughts that happen. You know, but they're not real because they never become an idea. They're just a thought, but you're not supposed to listen to those thoughts, girl. Those thoughts are not good thoughts. That's like, you follow that logically? I mean, so, like, I follow logically what you're saying, but so, it feels like it doesn't. So like, for instance, I could live a day. I could have a day where I'm very focused and I could do everything I could do on my ADHD medication, like normally, but I couldn't have a day where I don't take my insulin as a type one diabetic. Right. That one of those worlds is possible. One of them is not. Right. I, but, I but, those and the reason that you you are. So let me let me give you a different example. OK, so let's say. Let OK, sorry. If people think a thousand thoughts a day cap, I don't think at all. Can I tell you, obviously, not everyone else here has an inner monologue. So that's important. Everyone's brains work differently. My brain might think a thousand thoughts a day for like a different reason. But like, remember that. Right. Like everyone's thought. Everyone's different. Some people don't even have an internal monologues. So. Just like, don't say what I'm saying. Like, don't literally take it literal. Like mm -hmm. cholesterol medication. Now, sure. there are people who can get really upset about their cholesterol medication. Um, values are different than thoughts and ideas. Yes, but values come from thoughts and ideas, right? <clears throat> and having uh -huh. to take it every day. Can you imagine that? Uh -huh. No, I, I, I've got a family of fucking diabetics, and sometimes I don't even take their fucking insulin. So yeah, I'm very aware so, of that. So, I can so like people, that people are like, you know, like, oh, like I should be able to do this through diet. Like oh, their body kind of image okay, issues. Sure. This is the psychodynamics of psychopharmacology. We have all kinds of attachment to a particular pill, and what you're saying is this pill. I can understand how you would not have an attachment to, but this other pill logically has attachments for these reasons. No, bro, it's not logical. It's emotional. It's based on your attachment to that particular pill and what that pill means to you. It's not because of the neuro, it's not because of the physiologic thing. That's just what your mind says. 
right? Because what you're worried about, and this is true of all medication, is like, this is the part of my body that's weak. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, but I feel like, um, <clears throat> I, I, I feel like we don't, I feel like we don't view our brains as our bodies. I think that's like the fundamental difference here. Like if my sure. I don't think our brains are our bodies. All medication is like, this is the part of my body that's weak. Yeah, but I feel like, um, I, I, I feel like we don't, I feel like we don't view our brains as our bodies. I think that's like the fundamental difference here. Like if my sure. heart isn't doing something i take a medication for my heart if my you know lungs if my kidneys I, I take a medication for that. but but i but you don't view yourself as your brain that's like you right i feel yeah that's the difference god i don't see my brain as me i don't see my body as me i actually see my consciousness like a soul and my consciousness is the thing that exists and i think continues to exist even if my brain uh ceased to exist not that I believe in a literal soul, but since I know like energy like just gets recycled, I think of it that way where I, I think of it in three parts. I think of it as my brain, my consciousness and my body. So when I'm triggered because I've done therapy, now I know when my brain is triggered and it's like upset, I can sit in the back of my head as a consciousness and be like, oh, look, I'm being triggered right now. How weird. And I couldn't do that before. Before, when I was triggered, I was like in it. And even now when I'm triggered, sometimes I'm in it very quickly. Um, okay. But then if there is a, con like if there is an opportunity for my consciousness to watch my brain, like, like cross wires and become crazy, it's just like, ah, okay, cool. So I'm just like, I think there's like a me and then I think there's my brain and then I think there is a body, right? My consciousness just is and my body's a vehicle it uses for experience. Yeah. Like it's like, yeah. So I don't think of, because my brain is like a computer, but I'm what's on the computer and my ADHD, I don't have ADHD, that, sorry, my borderline impacts my consciousness and how it relates to the world because my machine has borderline but i don't think i i have borderline <laughs> like i don't think i am my borderline let me rephrase i don't think i am my borderline like if i got cancer <clears throat> i would say my my body is having technical difficulty in the same way that i think my brain is having te technical difficulty when it has borderline so that's interesting that his ADHD isn't like cancer because I consider my borderline just like as this thing that my my particular vessel has to like deal with but it's like not that deep right like it's just frustrating and it's a lot but yeah that's interesting yeah so but I mean when you say we who is in that we well, I was speaking we as in humans in general. I think we view ourselves as being our brain rather than like our brain as an organ in our body that we can medicate. Do you view yourself that way? I probably do. And yeah. Right. As, so I, I think this is where, uh -huh. where like, as I've, I'm telling you, man, I have worked with plenty of people who do not identify uh -huh. with their brain and identify with their body more. Yeah. Dancers. Think about dancers. That's right? really interesting. I almost oh, don't believe yeah. Like belly dancers. That. That's crazy. But I've worked with plenty of Listen to people Destiny. Listen who to do Steven. not identify uh -huh. with their brain and identify with their body more. That's right? really interesting. I almost don't oh, believe yeah. that. That's crazy. But okay, that's that's really interesting to me. Yeah, okay. Right? So like Oh, he... good. See, that was like an open. Usually he's like, I almost don't believe that. See how like he has such a bubble. Like he's so in his own little bubble, which is fine. We all are. And he's just like, what? But like, he was open this time. This time he was like a little open in his language. So I really appreciate that, right? But yeah, that's amazing. Like I think of dancers. Like I think of dancers right away. My ballet dancer friend, she talks about her body all everything is about her body like it's very interesting she's very thoughtful and introspective in her own way but her body is like she re like it's just so interesting you know or like football players or boxers or you think about anyone who's physical anyone who's a runner anyone who shuts off their brain to literally live their life through their body the yogis like i'm so that's so interesting to me that he hasn't met somebody with that lived experience yet but I guess not. If you're on the internet chronically, you're probably not meeting a lot of people who identify more with their bodies. Oh, <gasps> fair. Oh, fair, fair, fair. Interesting. 
You can take anyone with mm-hmm. body image issues. Who I am okay. is determined. This could also be because you're a dude and I'm a dude. Mm-hmm. So like we don't get at, judged as harshly on average. I'm not saying mm-hmm. that we don't get judged. And this is balancing out. Right. So like mm-hmm. it used to be that women had body image issues way more than men do. And when I work with women who have body image issues, they like, you know, a lot of who they are is tied up to their body and mm-hmm. working with. And that, that's not just one reason for that. I mean, that's evening out, by the way, I think with social media. But then there's like other things that biologically women go through that men don't have an equivalent, like pregnancy and childbirth. Mm-hmm. So when you go through pregnancy, it makes permanent alterations of your diabetes, your fat distribution. Um, you know, the, the change to breast tissue is profound. Right. Like when when they swell and you've got yeah. all this stuff like I mean, so like it, there there's definitely people can identify with the body. I think you're quite intellectual. And I think that you would be afraid you would you would fear losing a chunk of your brain way more than you would fear losing a, a piece of your hand. Yeah, of course. Right. But if I'm a professional wrestler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like exactly. it could be the other way around. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the key thing here is uh-huh. your attachment to it, which is the problem. That's okay. my yes. point. Attachment. What are we attached to? What is gender? And so the problem here is that once you dissolve that attachment, the conclusion that you assume disappears because the reason you infer that is because of your attachment to your brain over your body. I don't know if I lost you there, but. A little bit or or not, not, not you to lost me a little bit, but I follow you a little bit or I guess I would mean I did lose a little bit. So you're but, um, in your world. Yeah, like the, the, the brain and the body and then like the spirit or the soul or whatever. These things exist all kind of differently from one another and medicating your heart or medicating your liver or medicating your brain are all essentially the same thing. But I'm coming in with a normative judgment that loads brain medication differently. So all exactly. of my questions are kind of fundamentally poisoned. As soon as exactly. I ask exactly. Right. Because I say then it becomes just like a cholesterol medication. And what's your response? You say, no, it mm-hmm. doesn't. And then I ask you, why is it different? And then you're like, well, because mm-hmm. I'm my brain is different from body. And I'm like, well, hold on mm-hmm. a second. That is where you're inserting your judgment. Yeah. Right. So if we're if mm-hmm. we're really presuming that you've metabolized this stuff, then it then it does become that. And I've seen that process many times, by the way. Right. So like when you Which, work with the psychodynamics of psychopharmacology, people like taking their SSRI or their antidepressant medication. There's all mm-hmm. kinds of psychotherapy that you have to do around that. What does it mean to take? Okay. I'm dependent on this medication for my fundamental happiness in life. Oh my God, mm-hmm. I don't want to take happy pills. Like, this isn't like ADHD where we know that the brain is different. Like, this is just depression. Uh, right? With ADHD, these people are neurodivergent. Their brain is wired uh, differently. But mm-hmm. me, I was fine for the first 25 years of my life. And then something happened and I became weak. Right? Even those people will say ADHD medication is okay, but depression medication isn't. So it all has okay. to do with your attachment to the... Um, I would just like to say... That if Wick isn't equally upset with Destiny, whether he's on his meds or not. I'm just kidding. That's a throwback. I'm just kidding. We love Wick. I just think it's interesting that we're watching Steven have his own relationship with ADHD meds and a diagnosis. But please keep in mind that, like, see how it's optional to be on your meds and it helps the neurodivergency. And, you know, people are all looking at RJ like maybe she should be on her meds. Maybe she should be on her meds. It's up to her and her goals, right? Like if she notices she needs to get things done, like she says when she's a teacher, she takes her meds. When she's not a teacher, she probably needs it less. It's really nice, you know, hearing this conversation though. But like, yeah, when you're neurodivergent, you're just asking like, can these meds help get me on track, right? Like with borderline, um, there's not meds for borderlines, right? We don't have like specific meds. But with ADHD, there's lots of different meds. Some people take Ritalin, uh, 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 some people even take well butrin. Some people take Adderall. Some people take like there's so many Volt, 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 Volt. What is the other one? Voltrex. What's the other one? Everyone does it. There's like all different kinds of medication for ADHD because you're really just figuring out what's gonna help me stay on track, right? Yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah, yeah. Says is Destiny more open to Dr. K because of his credentials, because of his gender, or because he's more open in the last few months? I think a combination of all those things. If I'm being honest, something's obviously changed in Stephen's life, which we love to see. Fine, Vivans. Thank you. Obviously, something's changed in Stephen's life, which we love to see. It looks like he's really something is making him change. So that's really exciting. You know what I mean? Sorry, I missed that part. Destiny has ADHD, but why does he need meds? Did Destiny mention how he benefits from them? Um, he has some goals he wants to attain. Tell me if I'm wrong, guys. And he he's seeing that um, he might need meds to attain them. So that's why he's working on it. But he's calling Dr. K to kind of work, work out the shame he has around them because he does need them to attain his goals. He's noticing that he's he's needing help. And he basically feels you know, kind of ashamed about that help. So we're working on it. You know what I mean? Or he's working on it. You know what I mean? Um, okay, hold on. Uh, 
Dr. K can actually call Destiny out and get through to him. He has qualifications. He is far uh, enough from Destiny to be biased towards him. He's graceful enough. He's fair, far enough or fair enough? He's graceful enough. He has uh, established the rapport. Let's go. We love it. We'd love to see it. Let's go. By attachment, I'm using it in an Eastern sense. Like the the meaning that you... Oh, did we accidentally ban... Wait, Ingrid sometimes accidentally bans people. Ingrid, did you mean to ban her? Probably not, right? In Ingrid sometimes accidentally does this. Was this an accident? Wait, I'm the... Why can't I... Oh, you just muted her? Why can't I... Why did you mute her? Was it an accident? You can't mute her because she called you a troll. I put her in timeout. Was it because she called you a troll? Because I'm reading the comments right now. I don't think she technically... You can't m mute her because she called you a troll. That... I mean, I can mute people because they call me a troll. <laughs> no, my mods cannot mute people because they call them a troll. I can mute people when they call me a troll. <laughs> Ingrid, you're lucky you're one of my favorites. You can't do that. You can only... Okay, Jessica's back. Jessica's back. You can only mute people when they call me a troll. No, I'll do that. Don't do that. Girl. <laughs> you associate with that thing. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm hearing okay. through and through is that you associate a lot of meaning and you, you adapted beautifully and cognitively reframed beautifully and you're, whoever's prescribing the shit did a great job. Right? Because mm -hmm. you're taking it. Sounds like you're adherent. You're doing, doing all this other stuff. And by the way, there's a very simple answer to your question of like, how do I know? I think you asked a question, something about... Um, I, I see a lot that. of really positive outcomes and I don't know, like, is this like the medication is working now? Stephen Bunnell, I'm making good choices or am I just really high and now like I oh, can do oh, problem yeah. solving? Really, yeah. So, so that's mm -hmm. where from, from like if I'm teaching a med student class, like there's a really simple answer to that. That's why we have like measurable scientific validated instruments. Right. What so do you mean we, by that? For ADHD, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, for example, we, we will track symptoms. So okay. how do we know if it's the medication that's working or you're making good choices? Well, first of all, you have to remember that making good choices is a complex neuroscientific process, which the medic... Okay, listen to this part because it's so interesting. And this is the part I really wanted to hold out for. And this goes back to this idea of being a whole human being. Because remember, like making good decisions is a combination of so many things. But when you're in therapy and you're like, oh my gosh, like, am I only making good decisions because my therapist told me to? You're making good decisions based off of the values, understanding of yourself, like you're values and because you're you want to act that's why you're there hopefully you want to be better right um so you're having that conversation like how do I be better now for me I kind of have the philosophy of like I don't give a fuck if I'm high if it's working but working is contingent on my goals right and then you have to separate yourself into is my medication helping my mental health is philosophy helping my motivation for values is my um, physical health helping my body stay healthy, right? See how physical health is separate from mental health as well? These are different things. One feeds your consciousness. That's your spiritual health. One feeds your mental health. That's your brain. That's why they're separate to me. One feeds your body. That's your physical health. So if he was on medication for heart and on medication for ADHD, those are two different kinds for two different problems, right? And his consciousness, that's his spiritual health, which Dr. K is going to get into right now. How therapy... Right? Well, consciousness is one thing, but therapy is mental health too. Oh, that's hard to explain. Okay. I put mental health in the same category as like neurodivergency and spirituality as in the consciousness, but the consciousness is fed by going and fixing your mental health because then you can have a relationship with introspection on a deeper, more thoughtful scale. But uh, that sounds confusing. Don't misquote me. Oh, they work, they work together. They work together. Medication working could mean could it helps people make good choices. That's literally what the medication does, right? It corrects whatever weaknesses or supplements whatever weaknesses there are in the uh -huh. brain that prevent these people from making good choices. Now, there's a whole complicated yeah. thing there. So some people will consider ADHD medication to be like glasses. Uh -huh. It doesn't fix the problem. But as long that. as your glasses are, are on, your eyesight. ADHD medication is like glasses. That's how I see it. I see, med I see most medication is like wearing glasses. It's like wearing prescription glasses. Like what, you're not going to see because you're ashamed of having glasses? Bro, let's go. It is normal. I think it's a good analogy. 
But I think there's okay. all kinds of problems with that perspective. So, and if you look at the data on ADHD medication, there's some data that shows that the effect lingers for three to six months mm. after you stop the medication. So there are other things going on with taking the medication. Ooh, listen to that this. That could have to do with things like developing healthy habits. Habits, yeah, yep. that's one big thing. Yeah, that I habits. Right, so, so and that's because the, the habits, I mean, the neurotransmitters for the habit circuitry <laughs> and the location in the brain are completely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The real tragedy in ADHD is that since you are impulsive, you never get the ability to develop habits, Yeah, which is a real yeah. tragedy because the one thing that can protect you against your ADHD is the em it's endocannabinoid system that is habits. Yeah. yeah. This is so difficult. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Someone in the comments said little bro needs an ego death. Stop. Other questions? Mm. No, I don't think so. Okay. I wanted Anything to just else? share no. one or two things. Yeah, whatever you want, yeah. So when people think about ADHD, like I just wanted to like share how I understand what is effective about ADHD medication, what it does, and what it doesn't do. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at ADHD medication, we have to understand that the problems that people with ADHD have come from yeah, two places. Happens. They come from yeah. the neurodivergence of the brain, let's just call it that, and they come from living a life with neurodivergence. So there are these social impacts that come from basically having untreated or undiagnosed ADHD. So, um, you know, my favorite statistic about this is that oftentimes people won't have friends. So like kids with ADHD, by the time they hit the second grade, they stop getting invited to birthday parties. So they have difficulty socializing, um, you know, because they can't function well in school, their academic achievement goes down. This is why there is a causative impact in terms of depression later in life. It also creates the things that, uh, you know, I, I kind of see with a lot of people, which is a lot of so harsh self-judgment. A lot of, I should be able to do this. This yep. medical okay. illness is yep. different from all the other medical illnesses. And let me give you all the logical reasons why. <laughs> yeah. Right? You can't directly... Somebody in Discord said, I forget that wearing glasses is not really seen as a disability, but it is. Literally. Yeah. Guys, people have a hard time seeing... We just take for granted like that people get prescription glasses. But could you imagine living in a world like Dr. Stone where there's no glasses? In interact with your heart. You can't directly lower your triglycerides level. By the way, you can. But that's a conversation for a different day. Or when, I, when I said do it, I mean like think it down. That's what I mean. Yeah, Sorry, you yeah. can think it down. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, never mind. <laughs> okay, I believe you. Go ahead. Um, so sure. so it, it's wild, man. Okay. So uh, and anyway, it doesn't d disable your point. It's just, you know. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. And so when we're thinking about ADHD medication, like what's the goal here? And that's where like, I think we've got to understand two things. One is that even some of the trauma-induced consequences of grow Listen. growing up with ADHD mm -hmm. will create ADHD symptoms. Impairment yeah, okay. in concentration, difficulty focusing, um, difficulty with emotional regulation. If you look at the, the symptomatology of trauma and the symptomatology of ADHD, they overlap. And the real problem okay. that we see with ADHD is when you grow up with ADHD and you get traumatized because you recognize you're just as smart as everyone else, but you can't fucking do it. It's so easy. They're just sitting there and looking at a book and reading it. That's literally what reading is. It's just looking at a book. Yeah. You can fucking sit there and look at a book, but you can't read the words. And so you feel incompetent. And as you grow up with that ADHD, you start to experience various micro traumas or even macroscopic traumas. Parents getting mad at you. Why are you? Listen to this. You are so many components of a person. There's so many parts of you. And that's why I say we are all raised in dysfunction and we all have a relationship to, to trauma, right? And again, I know because you're successful and you're capable and you're like, but uh, it's, it, you're able to look functional until you face your dysfunction. And there's so much pain in being an undiagnosed kid. There's so much pain in being an undiagnosed kid or being a kid who's even diagnosed but neglected. Okay, you can do yourself so much. You can do yourself such like do such a service to yourself, whoever you are, by being okay with the fact that you were traumatized as a child or that life was trauma or you have trauma. It is so hard for us who are so successful in life to admit, you know, that this shit impacted us. But it's so real and it's there's so much help to be had. There's so much success that you could still have after this that it's insane. But it's really hard to face that like, yeah, you're capable and smart and you still need help. Right? Like I have pretty insane math anxiety and it like cripples me 
And I like crippled me in school. I like literally throw tantrums and cry because like I just didn't know what to do. And by tantrum, I mean I like go to the floor and cry and sink into a ball because I was like – and even now like if my partner gives me a random – sometimes he'll like math question and I'm like <gasps> – because, like, I have this, like, math anxiety. He's like, I'm so sorry. I know you have, like, this thing. It, like, it feels like someone is choking me, literally. And it's so – it's probably because of the dyslexia, if I'm being honest. So it's, like, it's very interesting. But then I was undiagnosed dyslexic, undiagnosed borderline, undiagnosed PTSD. And I had to literally go as an adult and try to get things figured out on my own and face the fact that my parents did the best they could. But because of their beliefs around these things – I couldn't get help sooner. And so I did the best I could. I was successful. I had, you know, multiple jobs. I had my own place. I had a partner. I had friends. I had everything, you know. Shadow B, please uh, do not throw math questions in the chat, bro. <laughs> so I get it. But, like, this is why this is so important is, like, sometimes it's, like, embarrassing to admit, like, you were traumatized in childhood, especially when you end up successful. But imagine how much more successful you could be in your family life, in your spiritual life, and everything else if you could just face every part of yourself. You like this, like, you know, you just need this. I do not have a diagnosis for dyslexia. I am diag I, I don't. I, I have a self-diagnosis. I'm not diagnosing myself. I'm 100% sure I have dyslexia, though. I have, like, every tenant of it. It's obvious when I reach at. Like, it's obvious with my life. Um, but my parents didn't believe in that stuff. And so as an adult, like... I haven't bothered to go get diagnosed, but I need to get a diagnosis for dys dyslexia, for ADHD and autism, just to see if I have it. Like, I want to go get tested formally. You know what I mean? But yeah. Study, you need to try harder. I used to get called into my, you know, teacher's office once a semester for my parent-teacher conference, and they'd say, if he just applied himself, he'd do so well. He's got so much potential. And so that kind of stuff creates its own kind of trauma-induced cognitive deficits. And then if we look at treatment of ADHD, stimulants can correct the neurodivergence, but all that other stuff is not going to get corrected with stimulants. See? The ADHD meds can help with the neurodivergency, but it's not going to heal your trauma. It's not going to heal your trauma. And some of those things, some of the other consequences that happen when we grow up with ADHD is we develop, we fail to develop adaptations. So we get worse mm -hmm. at developing like emotional regulation techniques and things like that. And the adaptations that we do develop growing up as a neurodivergent kid in a neurotypical world become maladaptations later in life. We're also more yeah. vulnerable to things like addictions and stuff like that. So when we look at stimulant medication, a lot like of- Like sex addiction? But doesn't get fixed, which confuses a lot of people. A lot of it does. If we look at stimulant medication, most of the research of the meta-analyses suggests that starting it early to prevent all of these psychological impacts will be protective in the long run and lead to better outcomes in terms of lifelong achievement, academic success, et cetera, et cetera. Right, because this, this is what you got to understand is you can have ADHD with certain cognitive deficits and untreated ADHD plus cognitive deficits plus failing out of school. What does that do to someone's psychological yep. trajectory, their life trajectory? Yep. There's recently a study that showed um, that the majority of reasons that people are depressed today have nothing to do with like internal feelings or their relationships. Yep. They have everything to do with circumstances in their existence. It's not us. It's everything we're dealing with in existence. Life. Lack of financial stability, yep. living at home, whatever, other kinds yep. of things. They're, they're like Exactly. Literally, what did I just made a podcast on this, right? I just made a podcast on this. I never wanted to unalive myself because I want to unalive myself. You make me want to unalive myself with your petty wars and your bullshit politics and your crappy sense of selves that you project onto me every day. Leave me the fuck alone. Life objectively sucks. And so when we're thinking about ADHD medication and whether to do it or not do it, I think this is what you really need to think about is that it's not going to fix everything, but it'll prevent a lot of damage, which is usually why we will medicate kids with ADHD if we choose to. Um, and that even if you start medication as an adult, it's not going to fix everything because there are the consequences of growing up with ADHD that need to be addressed. Yep. The last thing to consider is that the effect size of ADHD medication is basically the same or slightly inferior to psychotherapy. And this kind of circles back to like, can I do it without medication? The answer is probably yes, but it takes a concerted effort, which a lot of people don't have the bandwidth for. And there's also data that shows that medicating someone with ADHD makes the effect of psychotherapy better. So when you have someone who can pay attention in psychotherapy, they get a greater effect size. The other. The prospect of coming to terms like the way that you're saying, it just leaves me 
with a lot of dread. Maybe it's a headspace I'm in right now, but it feels overwhelming and dreadful. Honestly, fair. Fair. I think it is overwhelming, and I think that sense of dread is called existential dread. We're having an existential crisis with all the things we have to face in ourselves and outside of it, right? So fair, right? I think that that is a part of the process of like facing the self. Take your time, but do it now. Take your time. No big deal. Literally, there's no rush and no one's going to remember you after you die because like we're all just like a spot in history. So like no rush, but also like do it now, but also like literally no rush, but definitely do it now. The cool thing is that the effect of psychotherapy lingers for years after the completion of treatment compared to months for ADHD medication. Um, so this is kind of all a roundabout way of saying, you know, I, I still think that what you got to do what's right for you and everyone's got to do what's right for them. Uh, I think that there's a lot of very real. And this is giving him the opportunity to take a different path if this one doesn't work for him, but he is literally suggesting therapy. So he's suggesting to Steven without saying it. See, I'm too blunt. I'd be like, okay, bro. You need to fucking go to therapy for your fucking childhood because what a fucking mess that was. Jesus Christ. You need to tackle all the issues with like your parents, your lack of commitment, your fucking everything. Okay, just fucking tackle it. And then you got to get an HGD meds, which you did. Great job. Good for you, Gold Star. Okay, that's going to help the neurodivergency. Awesome. And then we're going to work like Dr. K won't say that. I would say that. See, you come to Brittany when you just want like a, a bullet point list. But with Dr. K, he's like, so you don't have to do this, literally, but, like, there's this thing. And he's not even saying – he's not even calling it therapy. Like, he's, like, avoiding certain language because he doesn't want to upset Stephen. All upsets – not Stephen, but anyone listening. You are a complex human being who needs to simply follow simple steps to get better. But the simple steps are only known to you after you figure yourself out. So, okay, therapy, philosophy, spiritually, all spirituality, all that stuff. But mostly fix your mental health. Fix your neurodivergency if you have it. Help it if you can. And most likely you will be able to. You know, getting to know yourself is the key. Ignoring yourself and not facing yourself is not doing yourself any favors. You want to be smart. You want to say, I know myself. So get to know yourself, girl. So when people ask you why, you actually know why. It's very difficult and it's not easy, but it's worth it shame and judgment that kids with ADHD develop and then carry into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And that if you really want to conquer this problem, um, I think it's usually like a combination of like all of the above. Yep. So medication, if that's what works for you, psychotherapy, yes. if you have the time and energy for it. And just as a prescriber myself, the primary reason I prescribe medication is when people don't have time to do everything else. That's mm. really, because I, I think there are very few cases where, at least in psychiatry, we really need medication. Like most in most cases, psychotherapy is just as effective as whatever we're prescribing. Love that. Okay. Um, See, don't always need medication for ADHD. So I think those are just a couple of considerations. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to chat. Yeah. Likewise. And good luck with all of your endeavors. And um, yeah, I, I really encourage you to continue exploring down. I'm sure you will. But what really like trying to get to the root of this stuff and and I, I'm I'm so curious about your personal take on spirituality and stuff like that because I, I think it's I think you're primed for it. More so yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> More so now than before is absolutely true, but yeah, oh! maybe from like one to six out of a hundred, but maybe, yeah. Oh <gasps> um Yeah, okay. Yeah. More prime than before. Are you just curious, are you going to TwitchCon or do you not say that publicly? Uh no, I'm not going to TwitchCon. Oh, He's going oh. to a spiritual retreat. Okay, that's the end of the video. Uh, Dr. K is going to go on a spiritual retreat. One, he hasn't he hasn't done it in like 12 years. So that's very exciting. I'm excited for him. Okay, guys, that's it. I don't have the spoons. We're not going to continue. We're not going to – we're going to look at your video bubbles tomorrow. I asked my Discord. I asked my chat to send me videos of bubbles they're in, of videos I've never seen on the internet. I want to view people I've never seen to see what they're doing with their lives. So I've got a whole playlist of videos to watch with you guys tomorrow. Any last uh, thoughts? Any ideas? It's 1230. I'm feeling a little headachy. I think I haven't taken a break and I need to go do that. Um, so overall, very excited for Steven's journey. I'm stoked for it. I think it's really a great sign. I'm so excited for him to do anything that will make his life better and for him to get closer to his joy. Love Dr. K. I just wanted to show you guys that because Dr. K explains so much 
of what I've personally experienced in my life, what I think my work is about. And maybe it's just my neurodivergent way of speaking, but I feel like uh, my audience gets me. I feel like I'm reaching the right people. I feel like I got the right callers and the right audience and the right Discord members. And I feel like we're all having the right conversations around these very complicated but simple dilemmas that we're all facing about ourselves, right? So that existing, you, me, me, my relationship with me, you, your relationship with you, and then existence, our relationship with each other and the things outside of ourselves. You know what I mean? It's just, it's so exciting. Like I love to see it happen. I, I'm stoked. I really hope. I just, yeah, I wish the absolute just best for Steven. I think that this is, this was a really great change in him. You know what I mean? So I'm just, I'm so excited. And Dr. Kate, mm, mm, mm. it's so good, so good. Maybe I'll get to talk to him one day too. I might be too excited though. Come in with my high energy and my excitement, you know? It might just be, it might be too much. In my head, in me life while I'm dead. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 